Hey, is can you see and hear me? Yes. And re really sorry for the delay. That is one reason I don't really conduct classes on weekdays. Previously, we have been conducting something called as Medicine Saturdays, right? So because I thought like Saturday, at least some, some days I might be free. So that's why Medicine Saturdays used to be at 10 o'clock. So, but unfortunately, there is a weekday. So I didn't get any slot to conduct this kind of session. So that's the reason why uh, it took a bit of time. So today, like it was a really, really hectic day. And uh, I don't know, I don't know how to explain. So it's like real bad day. And there are so many patients and a lot of people got sick today and it's heavily raining in Chennai as well. I know Delhi is having a heavy rain, but at the same time, Chennai is also heavily raining and uh, they have got like so many like different, different kinds of cases. So it's uh, becoming very tough. So anyway, sorry for making you wait. Sorry, really sorry. Apologies for that. Yeah. Still, we can teach, yeah, because doctors at the end of the day, like they are known for their like toughness, right? So anyway, we, we get tough over a period of time and it doesn't really matter. I hope you had a meal and again, like it's very usual, like we skip our meal. So it's like I always say doctors are very poor patients. So we advise everyone, but we don't really eat on time. We don't get to eat on time. And that's fine. So anyway, like I'm not someone who's going to be like uh, bothered about dinner or something. So it's like first always comes the patients. Second is the students and then comes everything. Nothing in between. Yes, guys. Thank you so much for all of your love and uh, all of your concern. Yeah. So today we're going to have a kind of a short discussion. It's not like... Uh, a prolonged discussion i try i'll try to finish within like a couple of hours so no need to bother much so we're going to discuss about the clinical part of cardiology yes we can follow the main notes for this yeah yeah this is a kind of a main class only so because it's a clinical session so i thought i'll do it as a live session so that we can interact with each other very well so what all we are going to discuss we're going to discuss about your blood pressure we are going to discuss about the different pulse waveforms and the arterial pulse we are going to discuss about uh, the jugular venous pressure waveforms and we'll be discussing about uh, the various heart sounds, the first and second heart sound, and we'll be discussing about some extra heart sounds. And we'll also be discussing on the murmur part, the systolic, diastolic, continuous murmurs. And we'll be also talking about the dynamic auscultation part. So this is the overall outline of what all we are going to discuss today. So let us start our discussion. First, let us talk about the blood pressure because we are concerned about the NEAT exam. Let me uh, give you a clear idea. Sorry for that. Right now, you I, I think the screen has disappeared. So one second. Yep. I think we're back. So yeah, so because we are concerned about the NEAT exams, so we need to discuss a kind of a crisp information, not everything about blood pressure and everything about pulse. There are some areas they regularly tend to ask about the blood pressure and the pulse. In fact, it's kind of a, a important topic that has become important in the recent past because in the last two, three years, they have been asking questions on uh, clinical cardiology stuff. So let us have a discussion on that first. So you know, blood pressure means you have systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. Everyone knows that. You have SBP and you're going to have diastolic blood pressure. And you all know that the difference between systolic and diastolic blood pressure will be called as something called as the pulse pressure. So pulse pressure is nothing but systolic blood pressure minus diastolic blood pressure. But right now, in the modern practice, we don't follow the crude pulse pressure. So according to the old concept, if the pulse pressure is more than 40, we tend to call it as increased pulse pressure or large volume pulse. If the pulse pressure is less than 20, we call it as reduced pulse pressure or narrow pulse or a small volume pulse. So we don't use this term. The reason for that is because uh, we have to compare the pulse pressure with the systolic blood pressure. So sometimes a, bl a blood pressure of 200 upon 140, we cannot say the pulse pressure is very high because the blood pressure is 200 upon 140. So it's a kind of a relative thing. We cannot really say because the actual difference is more than 40, the pulse pressure is very high. So that's why there is a new concept of something called as proportionate pulse pressure. This is what we look at in current practice. We don't look at the actual pulse pressure. 
So which means here, what we are going to do is we're going to compare the pulse pressure with the systolic blood pressure. So we're going to compare the pulse pressure with something called as systolic blood pressure. This is what we call it as something called as proportional or proportionate pulse pressure. So accordingly, what do you mean by normal proportionate pulse pressure? If it's in the range of 25 to 50 percentage, we call it as normal. Whenever the proportionate pulse pressure is more than 50 percentage, we call it as increased. Whenever the proportionate pulse pressure is less than 25 percentage, we call it as decreased. So according to the current practice, so this is what you have to follow, not the actual pulse pressure. But if you are attending a final year board exam, then your actual pulse pressure may matter. But uh, if you are practicing physician or if you're practicing in the modern era, then you have to look at the proportionate pulse pressure rather than the actual crude pulse pressure. Please be very clear about that. And there are some other crucial areas that they may ask in exam. That is point number one. So when will you call it as a significant difference in blood pressure between arms? So if there is a significant difference in blood pressure between two arms by more than 10 millimeters of mercury, you have to think about certain conditions. So first of all, you need to know the cutoff for significant difference in pulse pressure between arms. The cutoff is more than 10 millimeters of mercury. Then only you're going to call it as significant. So what are the classic conditions that's going to be associated with difference in blood pressure between arms? So point number one, anything that produces thoracic outlet syndrome. You all know. So what is the best example of thoracic outlet syndrome, anyone? So because there are 100 plus students attending this lecture right now. So is there anyone who can answer? So what, do you, what is the usual classic cause of a thoracic outlet syndrome? So obviously, you would have studied that in surgery. Yes, everyone is answering that is. Yep. Cervical rib. Cool. So that's correct. So we have many things like skillness, anterior syndrome, cervical rib. So plenty of other conditions are there. And we have like subclavian problems. Like some textbooks will mention something called a subclavian aneurysm. Subclavian aneurysm. Even that is a very important cause of significant blood pressure. I mean, I'm just telling subclavian aneurysm as an example. So Dr. Deep Tanil is asking difference between SBP or pulse pressure. No, no, no. We are talking about a difference in blood pressure. So that is SPP or probably DPP, but technically we're talking about SPP. So this is difference in blood pressure, difference in blood pressure between arms. That's what I mean. So not the pulse pressure. Okay, subclavian or any other subclavian problem, as I was telling, it's not just a subclavian aneurysm. Any other subclavian problem is going to cause a significant difference in blood pressure between arms. And you know, there are some vasculitis. Can you tell me a vasculitis that is often referred to as something called as pulseless disease? I think everyone can easily answer. So technically, any large vessel vasculitis can produce this. But, you know, the classic cause is going to be Takai's arteries. That's going to cause a significant difference in blood pressure between two arms. So usually, Takai's disease will be kind of asymmetric. The most common vessel involved in Takai's disease is going to be the subclavian artery. And most of the time, the involvement will be asymmetric so that uh, only in one arm, you don't feel the pulse. That's very classic of Takai's arteries. We have seen plenty of cases of Takai's where there will be an asymmetric pulse and blood pressure between arms. That is because of asymmetric subclavian involvement. And one radial pulse will be generally lost. That's why this disease is often referred to as pulseless disease. And we have some other conditions like coactation of aorta, not a common condition. Uh, it's a kind of a rare condition, but typically coactation of aorta is going to produce difference in pulse between arms and legs rather than difference in pulse between arms. But in some conditions like preductal coactation, in calm conditions like preductal coactation, you can have a significant difference in blood pressure between arms, but this is kind of rare. This is not common at all. But another important aortic problem, which you can actually diagnose in exam just based on the pressure difference between arms, is aortic dissection. So in exam, I told you so many times, if at all a patient comes with chest pain, plus or minus if the pain relates to the back, plus or minus if the pain relates to the back, and if you have a pulse difference or pressure difference between arms, that is aortic dissection and less broad otherwise. Only three points you need to know for exams. Chest pain, radiation to back, and asymmetric pulse and blood pressure between arms. So that is aortic dissection exam and less broad otherwise. A very, very common question. You should never forget. So it's a neat favorite and even an INSET favorite. And somebody is asking, what is GA? I'm not talking about GA. This is coactation of aorta. C-O-A. So sorry for the short forms. I'm a big fan of short forms, by the way. So COA, that's what we write. That stands for coactation of aorta. And there's another condition 
called as supravalvular aortic stenosis. I think everyone will agree with me. There is a condition called as supravalvular aortic stenosis. So it's not valvular, it's not subvalvular. Rather, we're talking about supravalvular aortic stenosis. Here, the orientation of aorta will be in such a way that your blood flow to the right side is going to be more than the blood flow to the left side, which means your right carotid, right subclavian is going to receive more blood compared to that of the left carotid and left subclavian. And this is due to a simple physiological effect called as coined effect. It's a simple effect you would have studied in physics. So, you know, if you take a glass of water and you try to pour the glass of water, so try to pour it very slowly. You have to take a glass, uh, like routine glass. You should not take the tumbler. Tumbler is different. So a tumbler is actually designed to avoid the coined effect. But if you take a usual glass, the tea glass, and try to pour the water a little slowly, what happens is the fluid is going to flow along the surface of the glass and then it will come down. So that's the reason for why uh, you cannot pour like uh, any fluid from the tea glass that easily. You cannot transfer fluid because it's going to flow along the surface and it's going to leak down to the like table or floor or whatever it is. So that's what we basically called as coined effect. So what is coined effect? It's the tendency of a fluid or a gas to pass along the surface of a substance is what we called as coined effect. And here, the mechanism of why the right-sided flows are more than the left-sided flows is basically due to coined effect. So that can be asked in exams. And you know what is a classic cause of supravalar aortic stenosis? It's Williams syndrome. Everyone knows what is Williams syndrome and what is the triad of Williams syndrome. So this is a classic cause, Williams syndrome. In fact, it follows a classic triad. So Williams syndrome patients will be having the characteristic elfin phases. I hope in pediatrics you'd have studied. So Anand sir would have definitely uh, discussed in great depth about the Williams syndrome and the elfin phases. Then number two, you have something called hypercalcemia. Third one is supravalvular aortic stenosis. Supravalvular aortic stenosis. This is a classic triad of Williams syndrome. You all know that where supravalvular AS is extremely, extremely common. And apart from that, I said, in supravalvular AS, the right-sided pressures will be more than the left-sided pressures, which means the blood flow to the right carotid will be more than the left carotid and the blood flow to the right subclavian will be more than the left subclavian, which means the right arm BP will be generally more than the left arm BP. And uh, to be honest, the murmur of this aortic stenosis, you know, whenever there is an aortic stenosis murmur, it's going to radiate to both the carotids. We all know that. But in supravalvular AS, the murmur radiation also will be more on the right side compared to that of the left side. Even that is a very, very important point. Okay, the murmur radiation of AS is also going to be uh, more on the right side compared to that of the left side. So these are the classic causes of your blood pressure difference between like both the arms. And patients can develop difference in blood pressure between arms and legs as well. Patients can develop difference in blood pressure between arms and legs. So when you call it significant, whenever the difference in blood pressure between arms and legs is more than 20 millimeters of mercury, we call it as significant. Can anyone tell what is the classic cause? You would have studied you know, one valvular heart disease where blood pressure is going to be different between arms and legs, where your lower limb blood pressure will be more than your upper limb blood pressure. No, no, no. I know you will say coarctation of aorta, but I told about valvular heart disease, where your lower limb blood pressure will be more than the upper limb blood pressure. Yes, Dr. Deepanshu is correct. It is basically aortic regurgitation. So you know what is that sign called as? What is that sign called as? In aortic regurgitation, you have that characteristic sign, right? When our blood pressure is more in the lower limbs by more than 20 compared to that of upper limbs. Yes, that's correct. You're going to call it as Hill's sign. Again, a very commonly asked question in exam. Do you think hill sign is real or hill sign is an artifact? Who's going to give the right answer? Hill sign is real or hill sign is an artifact? Hill sign is actually not a real sign. You have to know that it's basically a kind of an artifact. So if you measure the intra-arterial blood pressure, if you measure the intra-arterial blood pressure, which is the gold standard for blood pressure measurement, so it's going to be normal. You're not going to have any significant difference. Basically, Hill sign is thought to be a sphygmomanometric artifact because the vessels will be hyperdynamic in aortic regurgitation. So it's a kind of a sphygmomanometric artifact. It's not a real sign. So if in intraarterial blood pressure recordings, you're not going to have any difference in blood pressure. So that's Hill sign. Okay, second important cause, coarctation of aorta. Very, very important. In fact, I told you, most of the case of coarctation of aorta will be a post-ductal coarctation and not a pre-ductal coarctation. So that's the most common type. 
So most commonly in coarctation of vita, you're going to have significant difference in blood pressure between arms and legs rather than pressure uh, difference between arms. So technically in coarctation of vita, the upper limb blood pressure will be more than the lower limb blood pressure. That's why in coarctation, you're going to have upper limb hypertension and lower limb hypotension. So in aortic regurgitation, the lower limb blood pressure will be in coarctation of vita, you're going to have higher upper limb blood pressure compared to the of lower limb blood pressure because of the obstruction in the iota, quite segment in the iota. And third important cause, maybe I can say peripheral arterial disease. In fact, this is a very, very common cause, peripheral arterial disease. And uh, you know, peripheral arterial disease commonly affects lower limbs compared to the of upper limbs. It can affect the upper limbs also. So theoretically speaking, you can have pressure difference of more than 10 millimeter between arms also because of peripheral arterial disease. But you know, characteristically, when you talk about peripheral arterial disease, it's going to typically affect the lower limbs than the upper limbs. Okay, uh, lower limbs compared to the upper limbs. So this is the very reason for uh, one important testing. Can you tell what is the testing that we do in practice to find out peripheral arterial disease? In fact, it's one of the first tests that we do in suspected peripheral arterial disease. What is the test? So because this is the this difference in pressure is the basis of that test. Yes, that's called as ABPA or ABI. So that's called ankle brickle index or ankle brickle pressure index. Why we do that? Because we know that there's going to be a significant difference in blood pressure between arms and legs if there is a problem in the vessel. So can you tell me what ABA is abnormal? So below which the ABA is thought to be abnormal? Below which ABA is thought to be abnormal? No, no, no. Less than 0.3 is a severe peripheral arterial disease. The actual cutoff is 0 0.9. Yes, most of you are right. 0 0.9. I repeat 0 0.9. If the ankle brachial index is less than 0.9, so that is suggestive of peripheral arterial disease. So you have to probably work up further. Yes, so normal value is 0 0.9 to 1.4. That's normal. Anything more than 1.4 is also abnormal. Supernormal value, it indicates a non-compliant vessel. Less than 0 0.9 clearly suggests that the patient is having a peripheral arterial disease for sure. So these are the classic three conditions where you're going to have pressure difference between arms and legs. So don't worry about that. So these are the important causes. So now... It's understandable. So next important thing about the blood pressure is the pulses paradoxes. So we have something called as pulses paradoxes. So you know what is pulses paradox? It's actually not based on uh, pulse. It's actually based on the blood pressure. So you all know if the fall in the systolic blood pressure is more than 10 millimeters of mercury during inspiration. So that is what we call as pulses paradoxes. So you all know there is a golden rule in cardiology. Everyone knows, right? So there's a golden rule in cardiology. All the pressures decrease during inspiration. During inspiration, all pressures decrease. What are the all? Uh, what are the pressures that are related to cardiology? So first one is intrathoracic pressure. Second one is going to be your blood pressure. Third one is going to be the jugular venous pressure. This is a general rule in cardiology. All the pressures are going to decrease during inspiration. And vice versa is true. It's going to become normal during expiration, which means expiration is a passive process. That's the baseline. So blood pressure decreases during inspiration. JVP decreases during inspiration. Intrathoracic pressure decreases during inspiration. And everything comes back to normal during expiration, which means you can imagine that it can increase during expiration. So that's one way to remember. But I won't say it's actually increasing. It's coming back to the baseline. So after that decline in inspiration. So this is what is going to be more important. So intrathoracic pressure, blood pressure, JVP, everything decrease during inspiration. At a typical undergrad level, you can think that these pressures are going to increase with expression. But as I said, they're not actually increasing. They're coming back to their baseline values. So you know that blood pressure decline during inspiration is the kind of a normal entity. It's a normal event, right? But how much it should decrease is very important. So usual decline is going to be around 5 to 7 millimeters of mercury and not more than that. If the blood pressure decline during inspiration is more than 10 millimeters of mercury, we call it as pulses paradox, which means it's an exaggerated normal physiology. That's all. It's a kind of an exaggerated normal physiology. Then why it is called as pulses paradoxes? It's an old term. It's basically not a misnomer, but a very old term. In the past, what doctors thought is, uh, in certain conditions like tamponade, where you get pulses paradoxes, during inspiration, because the systolic BP falled dramatically, these doctors were not able to feel the pulse because of the rapid drop in blood pressure during inspiration. That's why it was a paradox for them. They could feel the heart rate, heartbeat, but during inspiration, despite feeling the heartbeat, they are not able to feel the pulse because of the dramatic drop in 
SBP during inspiration. So that's why they, it was a paradox for them. That's why they named it as pulses paradoxes. But right now we know the mechanisms, we know everything about it. So that's why you can clearly say it's just an exaggeration of the normal physiological phenomenon. If the blood pressure drop is more than 10 mm during inspiration, you call it as pulses paradoxes. And it's important to understand that while measuring pulses paradoxes, you should not ask the patient to take a deep breath, hold the breath and all those things to measure pulses paradoxes, your patient must be breathing normally. That's a very, very important point given in all the textbooks, including Harrison. Patient has to be breathing normally. In fact, it's one of the old AIMS question also. Patient should be breathing normally while checking for pulses paradoxes. Don't ask the patient to hold the breath or don't ask the patient to do any manoeuvres. Otherwise, it becomes something else. So patient should be breathing normally. And what are the conditions that cause pulses paradoxes? Classic condition, exam, you have to answer cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade. Classic condition is going to be cardiac tamponade. Even though 25% cases of constrictive pericarditis, 25% cases of constrictive pericarditis can cause pulses paradoxes, please don't answer this in exam unless and until it's multiple answer type question or it's specifically asked for. Otherwise, don't answer this. Answer only if they ask. 28% case of constrictive pericarditis also can technically produce pulses paradoxes. Apart from that, acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma as well as COPD can produce pulses paradoxes. I mean, in the textbooks, you will see something called as uh, status asthmaticus. So, sir, both SBP and DPP decrease on special. No, 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 no. This is a see, this is based on cardiac ca cardiac issue. So this dynamics is based on the heart. So it's going to affect only the systolic blood pressure. If the dynamics is going to affect the iota or the vessels, then probably DBP will be altered. But because this is something that's not related to uh, iota or peripheral vessels, it's going to affect the systolic blood pressure. We don't talk about, say, SBP. We're not going to talk about, uh, like, your uh, diastolic blood pressure here at all. So nevertheless, can you understand why in acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma and COPD, it's going to, like, kind of cause pulses paradoxes? I think it's easy to understand. You know that in acute exacerbation, your depth of breathing is going to increase. Simple explanation. Let me breathe normally like this. You know, the BP drop during inspiration is going to be 5 to 7 millimeters of mercury. What happens if I'm going to take a deep breath? What happens here? So my SBP is going to decline by maybe 10 millimeters of mercury now. What happens if I take a very deep breath? So what happens here? So I'm breathing deep and fast. So my respiratory swings of blood pressure is also going to increase so much. So that's the reason because the difference is going to get augmented because of my deeper breaths and like more powerful expiration. So the difference between SPP uh, during inspiration and expiration will be augmented. So that's the reason why in acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma and COPD, it's basically going to cause a kind of pulses paradoxes. Are you able to understand? So why respiratory conditions also can produce uh, kind of pulses paradoxes. Yes, right. So plus at the same time, there are other conditions like tension pneumothorax. Again, same thing. So tension pneumothorax is also a respiratory condition where the patient will be breathing like hard and fast. So in that condition also you're going to have kind of pulses paradoxes. And there are so many other conditions like for example, uh, right ventricular failure, acute pulmonary embolism, plenty of conditions that can produce pulses paradoxes. But trust me in exam, don't forget tamponade. First thing that you have to think about when it comes to pulses paradoxes tamperon. Second thing, acute exacerbation of COPD or you can give acute severe asthma, status asthmaticus, whatever you want you can say. So these two conditions very important. Please don't forget. And next thing what I'm going to talk about is something called as orthostatic hypotension. There is something called orthostatic hypotension. Orthostatic hypotension. So what do you mean by orthostatic hypotension? So definition wise, if the systolic blood pressure falls by more than 20 millimeters of mercury, more than 20 millimeters of mercury, or if the diastolic blood pressure falls by more than 10 millimeters of mercury within three minutes of standing, within three minutes of standing. So this is what we call as orthostatic hypotension. If the SBP falls by more than 20 and or if the DBP falls by more than 10 within three minutes of standing, we are going to call it as orthostatic hypotension. Right. So this is the definition. There are plenty of conditions. So like, for example, old age itself can produce orthostatic hypotension. Uh, there are some, uh, what is the most common condition that you see in day-to-day -day practice, which causes autonomic neuropathy? 
So basically, it's a kind of an atomic failure, right? So what is the daily day-to-day -day condition that you see in your practice in your OPD that causes autonomic neuropathy? Yes, absolutely correct. Diabetes, diabetic neuropathy can produce autonomic neuropathy. And that can produce orthostatic hypotension. And elderly patients, because of stiff vessels itself, they can develop orthostatic hypotension. Even pheochromocytoma can produce orthostatic hypotension because of receptor tachyphylaxis. And a lot of neurodegenerative disorders can produce orthostatic hypotension. But Deepanchi is telling Parkinson's, but one type of atypical Parkinson is going to produce orthostatic hypertension commonly because of autonomic failure. That is multiple system atrophy. Okay, MSA, multiple system atrophy. That's very important. Not just Parkinsonism, it's actually MSA. So that's an atypical Parkinson kind of a disorder. So that is going to produce orthostatic hypertension commonly because of autonomic failure. So likewise, you can keep on telling causes. Anything that causes autonomic failure can result in um, orthostatic hypertension. Yes, pheochromocytoma is correct. Okay, all right. So this is about your important things with regards to blood pressure. And we also have to know about the blood pressure response uh, with regards to Valsalva. So Valsalva is kind of like a forced expression against a closed glottis. This is the definition. But in practice, you need to know how to do a Valsalva. So anything that you are, I mean, anything that is straining maneuver is a kind of Valsalva. For example, if you're constipated, how you're going to strain in the bathroom, that's kind of Valsalva. When you're lifting something heavy, so strain, right? So that's also in Valsalva. So when you explain the patient, just tell them to strain. So that's basically Valsalva. That's why the initial two phases of Valsalva is often referred to as something called as strain phase. The initial two phases are often referred to as something called as strain phase. But you cannot ask the patient to keep on straining forever, right? So at one point, the patient has to relax. So patient should stop the straining. And once the patient stops the straining, this is what we're going to call it as release phase. So the stages three and four will be called as release phase. And the initial two phases will be called as strain phase. So what happens in the strain phase? You can notice the normal responses. Initially, the blood pressure is going to increase. That is because of sudden increase in intrathoracic pressure. This is because of sudden increase in intrathoracic pressure. The BP will rise because it compresses on the aorta. There will be a transient increase in blood pressure. And after that, if the strain is sustained, obviously this increased intrathoracic pressure is going to decrease the venous return to the heart. Because of high intrathoracic pressure, that will cut off the blood flow from the great veins like SVC and IVC that is flowing back into the heart. So basically, because of reduced venous return, you're going to have decline in the blood pressure. So and this decline in the blood pressure will be sensed by the sympathetic system. And that is going to cause a kind of tachycardic response because we know the BP is falling. So sympathetic system wakes up and that's going to increase the heart rate. And that increase in the heart rate will try to slowly normalize the blood pressure. So it will not normalize it, but it kind of tries to normalize the blood pressure. At that point, you are entering the release phase, which means you are releasing the Valsalva all of a sudden. So there will be a transient decline in the blood pressure from there on. So this is because of drop in the intrathoracic pressure. All of a sudden, you are releasing it. That's why. And uh, in the strain phase, you have not allowed the blood to flow via SVC and IVC freely, right? So that blood that has accumulated in the SVC and IVC now is going to gush back towards the heart, resulting in increased venous return. And that is going to cause a kind of an increase in the blood pressure in the fourth phase. And it will be a kind of a sustained increase for quite some time. So this is the phase four. This is a very, very important phase. This is called as overshoot phase. So wh why it's called overshoot phase? Because the blood pressure is not just coming back to the baseline. The blood pressure is actually increasing and it is sustained for some time. So that's why this phase four is often referred to as something called as overshoot phase. So we have four phases, two strain phase, two release phase. In, that, in the first phase, the BP will transiently increase. Then because of low venous return, BP will drop. And then in the third phase, the BP will drop further because of the immediate release. And because the increased venous return, subsequently in the phase four, BP is going to increase. This is called as overshoot phase. So what happens in systolic dysfunction? Suppose if there is a systolic heart failure or a systolic dysfunction, you're going to have a kind of an absent overshoot. Remember, whenever the venous return increases back to the heart, uh, by your simple frank styling, like the heart is not failing, if the heart is not failing, then this increased venous return should be tackled easily by the heart by increasing the force of contractility. And that is the reason for the overshoot phase. Suppose if the patient is not able to increase the blood pressure, means the heart is failing. 
So it means it's not obeying the frank starling law means heart is failing. That is a kind of a systolic heart failure. That's the reason why in systolic heart failure, you're going to have a kind of a oh, absent overshoot. The overshoot phase will be absent. Phase four will be absent. That increase in blood pressure is something that you won't see in phase four. So that indicates a systolic dysfunction or a systolic heart failure. On top of that, what will happen if the patient is having a diastolic dysfunction? So that can be assessed with the help of phase two. During phase two, when the venous return decreases, the pressure should drop, right? The pressure should drop. That's normal response. But what's happening here, even in the phase two, the increase in pressure is continuing, which means the ventricle is not able to relax as the venous return is decreasing, which indicates a relaxation problem that is a diastolic dysfunction. This kind of response is what we call a square wave response. This kind of response is what we call a square wave response, which indicates diastolic dysfunction of the heart. So absent overshoot, systolic dysfunction or systolic heart failure. Square wave response, sustained increase in BP in the phase two also is indicative of diastolic dysfunction or diastolic heart failure. So what are the things? Let us recap. There are so many things that I have discussed in this slide. First, I talked about the pulse pressure. Then I talked about the proportionate pulse pressure. Then I talked about the blood pressure difference between arms. Then I talked about the blood pressure difference between arms and legs. Then I talked about pulses, paradoxes, and its causes. Then I talked about orthostatic hypotension. And finally, I talked about the valsalva response to blood pressure and what will happen in uh, both systolic as well as diastolic dysfunction. If you have understood this slide, let us move on. Have you understood? These are the most important things that you have to know for exams. I think like beyond this, I don't think they'll be asking anything else, by the way. Right? Cool. All right. Let us move on to the next slide now. So now we are going to talk about something called as arterial pulse, a very, very basic kind of a topic. Um, some people may struggle with this, but actually it's a very simple one. So all you need to know is some causes here and there will be asked in exams. So what is the normal arterial pulse? This is a kind of a normal arterial pulse. So only in one textbook it will be given. So that is a kind of parallel of, so where they actually mention what is the name of the normal pulse. Can anyone say what is the name of the normal pulse? So normal pulse has got a name. So what is that name? I, I used to tell in my classes every time. Yes, Dr. Ali. <laughs> yes, that's correct. So I used to tell often in my classes, the normal pulse name is catacrotic pulse. This normal pulse is catacrotic in nature. Perfect. So that's a catacrotic pulse. And what are the components of the normal pulse waveform? You're going to have a kind of a percussion wave. Uh, then you tend to have a small anacrotic notch. This is actually based on the Bernoulli effect because in the rapid ejection phase, because the blood flows rapidly, uh, the velocities will increase, the pressures will drop. We have discussed that already so many times in the valvular heart disease and congenital heart disease section. So because of that, the walls of the aorta will get sucked in between because of the low pressure. That causes a transient decline in the blood flow. That's what is going to produce that anacrotic notch in the ascending limb of the pulse. And you're going to have a peak eventually. That's the peak of the pulse, the pulse peak. And then you're going to have the reflected wave because this pulse wave hits the periphery and comes back towards uh, the pal palpating area that's called as tidal wave. So that's a descending limb. And then you tend to have something called as dichrotic notch. This is called as dichrotic notch. Like anachrotic notch, you have the dichrotic notch. So dichrotic notch indicates that the seminar valves have closed. Very, very important point. Whenever you get a dichrotic notch, this indicates that the seminar valves have closed. Closed of seminar valves and elastic recoil of the large vessels like aorta and pulmonary artery. But we are talking about peripheral pulse, right? So we are talking about aorta. So even pulmonary artery produces dichrotic notch, but we don't palpate it. So because it's in the pulmonary circulation. So aorta, when it recoils back, along with closure of seminar valve, is going to produce that characteristic dichrotic notch. And then you're going to get that dichrotic wave so DER stands for the dichrotic wave so which is kind of a wave that's produced because of the elastic recoil of the iota so basically dichrotic notch and dichrotic wave is due to elastic recoil of iota so that's all so percussion wave anachrotic notch pulse peak tidal wave that's a reflected wave then you have a dichrotic notch and then you have a dichrotic wave so that's it so this is the normal component of the pulse so if you look at the pulse contour it keeps on changing from carotid to brachial to radial to femoral. Okay. So first you're going to feel the carotid pulse. Then because uh, like brachial is little away from carotid, you will see the brachial pulse next. Then radial and femoral are almost heard, at, I mean, almost felt at the same time. So you can see some difference between carotid, brachial, radial, femoral. But radial and femoral like happens almost instantaneously. Uh, if you look at radial pulse, it will occur at approximately maybe 75 milliseconds after the 
heartbeat and if you look at the femoral pulse it's gonna occur around 80 milliseconds after the heartbeat so technically speaking there's only five millisecond gap just a five millisecond gap that's what i'm trying to say five millisecond gap between radial pulse and femoral pulse so technically you won't be able to like appreciate this in your clinical examination so radial and femoral pulse should be almost simultaneous by your knowledge it should be simultaneous because there's only five millisecond gap which you cannot appreciate so if there is an appreciable difference between radial and femoral pulse so that's what we're going to call it as something called as radio femoral delay so you know you call it as radio femoral delay this should not be appreciable normally even though there's a five millisecond gap but if there is any significant appreciable difference this is what we call it as radio femoral delay radio femoral delay can you tell me the classic cause of radio femoral delay anyone just one cause i want so classic cause of radio femoral delay there could be plenty of causes but what is the classic cause yes that's called coarctation of vita very very important so in an exam whenever they mention about radio femoral delay i think we have discussed it already did we discuss already i think i told you this already in the previous section on congenital heart disease under coarctation of vita didn't we discuss this if you remember so I think a lot of students would have attended the previous session also on congenital heart disease. Yes, we did discuss. I especially mentioned about this point. Very, very important for exams. Whenever there is a radio femoral delay in exam, always think about coarctation of IATA as the first possibility. All right. And one important difference that you can notice is as you move from proximal to distal, proximal to distal, you can notice that obvious change in the pulse contour. Obvious change in the pulse contour. So you can notice that the reflected wave is actually kind of prominent right so this is the reflected wave right so this is the reflected wave okay so you are actually noticing a prominence of the tidal wave that's the reflected wave so it's very simple so look at the well so when you are closing i mean you're standing very close to the wall of the well you will feel the reflected wave better or when you are near the center of the well you will feel the reflected wave better where you will feel the reflected wave better well see when you are standing near the it i mean uh, near the wall of the well you will feel the reflected wave better we are talking about reflection right or when you are standing near the center of the well you will feel the reflected wave better no actually if you are standing near the wall of the well only you will feel the reflections better because as it comes closer to the center Yes, you will not be able to feel the reflected wave better, right? So that's the reason why as you move towards the periphery, the reflections become very, very strong. The reflections become very, very strong. Yes, just like in the ocean, correct? The reflections become very, very strong. So that's why you're noticing that uh, in the carotid pulse, the tidal wave, the reflected wave is not that strong. But as you go to the periphery, like uh, your reflected wave is getting much, much bigger. And that's one thing that you're going to notice. And second thing, you can see obvious difference. Look at the diastolic wave. I told you the diastolic, the dichrotic wave is basically kind of uh, recoil of the iatra. It's because of the recoil of the iatra, right? So what you're noticing is as you are going towards the periphery, towards the femoral pulse and the radial pulse, the dichrotic wave is actually coming down. Yes, that is like expected, right? So you're moving farther away from the center. So the elastic recoil of the iota is not felt that easily right so as you're moving away from the central vessels so away from the iota the more you move from away from the iota you'll not be able to feel the dichrotic wave that better so that's why the dichrotic waves technically becomes very small as you move away so that's why you can see that the dichrotic wave becomes smaller so the pulse contour becomes obviously like kind of different as you move away so can you see can you see the difference so can you understand why the difference is there so that is the reason why you have to understand so what is tidal wave and what is the dichrotic wave. What is the reasons for that? So I think hope you understand. Shall we move on? If you have understood this, why there is a difference in the contour of the pulse. Are you able to understand? Yes. Cool. Okay. Now let us move on to the uh, different... Uh, types of abnormal pulse how can you divide the abnormal pulse like for example you have something called as a pulses parvus pulses parvus so what do you mean pulses parvus parvus means small volume right so what is the classic cause of pulses parvus parvus means small volume pulse 
we are tick stenosis but technically any stenotic lesions including ms can produce a small volume pulse that's called as pulses parvus so remember it's not just as even though in textbook classically it's as but Shraddha is asking, please explain normal arterial pulse. Just hold on, I'll finish off this and then I'll come back to the target. So pulses parvus means it's aortic stenosis. Yes, but any stenotic lesion can produce a small volume pulse. But typical example is, and what do you mean by pulses magnus? What do you mean by pulses magnus? It's a large volume pulse, very large volume pulse. Where you see magnus, magnus means large, magnified. So where you see that classic cause, just you want one cause. Yes, aortic regurgitation. Iotic regurgitation. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pulses magnus. Iotic regurgitation. Okay. So next, and I mean, if at all they ask in exam, what are the classic causes of small volume pulse? Volume is different from character. So remember, we are talking, talking about character of the pulse. Character. But here, what I'm talking about is the pulse volume. Volume is different. Volume means small volume pulse is also called as hypokinetic pulse. Hypokinetic pulse. So what are the classic cause of like small volume hypokinetic pulse? So technically, uh, any stenotic lesions. Stenotic in the sense, we're talking about ASMS. Can produce a small volume pulse or hypokinetic pulse. Then um, we have something called as uh, shock states. Any shock can technically result in small volume pulse and even heart failure. Even though you would have studied that heart failure can produce uh, pulses alternates. But if the patient is in cardiogenic shock, Obviously, you're going to have a small volume pulse only, which is typical of heart failure. What tremor pulse is not the same as pulses magnus. That's different. Pulses magnus is just a large, like uh, volume kind of pulse that you're feeling in the hand. But uh, water hammer pulse is a kind of a rapid rising and a rapidly collapsing pulse. So that's basically water hammer pulse. It's slightly different from pulses magnus. We'll talk about that. And we have something called large volume pulse. Large volume pulse means we're talking about uh, hyperkinetic pulse. Okay, more than kinetics volume means it's it's kind of slightly different. So what are the examples of large volume pulse? Can anyone say it's aortic regurgitation? Please don't say MR and VSD. I told you so many times in MR and VSD, you'll have only a normal volume pulse, not a large volume pulse. AR is a classic condition of a large volume pulse and uh, hyperdynamic circulation, hyperdynamic states. Hyperdynamic states. Whenever you talk about hyperdynamic states, there are a few classic conditions that you have to think in exam. Yes, severe anemia. Thyrotoxicosis, very, very pregnancy, then um, what else? Paget's disease, AV malformations, high fever and sepsis. So these are typical hyperdynamic states. Okay, clear? So there are six to seven conditions that should come out spontaneously as a final year medical student. Okay. So what what are the things you have to think about? I tell you again, severe fever, sepsis, then uh, beriberi, -beri, thyrotoxicosis, severe anemia, pregnancy, Paget's disease, AV fistula. So these are classic conditions of hyperdynamic states. Diastolic heart failure also can produce large volume pulse. Large volume pulse. Diastole. See, any heart failure is going to produce only a small volume pulse. How can it produce? Heart failure can produce a large volume pulse. I don't really understand. It depends on the dynamics of the ventricle. The ventricle is failing. If it's not able to pump enough blood, how can I get a large volume pulse? So most of the like heart failures are going to produce only small volume pulse, technically speaking. So this is about the pulse volume, small volume hypokinetic and large volume pulse. Trust me, commonly you will think that MR and VSD is going to produce only large volume pulse. No MR and VSD we have discussed already in congenital heart disease as well as in the valvular heart disease section. It's going to produce normal volume pulse. The pulse will be hyperkinetic in nature. It will be brisk. Remember, it will be brisk pulse, a kind of a fast racing hyperkinetic pulse that because of forcible LV contraction in MR and VST, but it will be of normal volume pulse only. I mean, guys who have attended that previous session, haven't we discussed about this? That pulse is going to be of normal volume? Yes or no? In MR and VST, did we, didn't we discuss? Just tell us. I told you this so many times. Yes, that's correct. So MR and VST is going to have a normal volume pulse. It could be hyperkinetic, brisk, but normal volume. Be very clear about that. So, okay, now let us come back to the character of the pulse. So pulses parvus fine, pulses magnus fine, and uh, we have something called as uh, collapsing pulse or Watson's water hammer pulse, collapsing or Watson's water hammer pulse. So what is collapsing pulse? You're going to have a rapid rise and a rapid fall. So that's collapsing pulse. Let us have a look at this diagram. So you see what's happening in severe AR. So there's a kind of a rapid rise and then there is a rapid fall. 
So in collapsing pulse. So the classic condition is severe AR. So what happens here? Why there is a rapid rise, dramatic rise? That is because of very powerful LV contraction. Because in severe AR, the LV volume will be very high. We have discussed that already. You're going to have a sudden a rapid rise in the pulse, a brisk rise in the pulse because of like a significant LV contraction. And there is a dramatic fall as well. There's a dramatic fall in the pulse contour as well immediately that's this is basically the collapsing pulse so rapid rise followed by a rapid fall so that's collapsing pulse so what is the reason for this rapid fall i told you so many times it's because of a mechanism called as runoff runoff can be of two types one is called as central runoff and second is called as peripheral runoff central runoff means the blood doesn't stay in the arterial compartment it stays i mean it, it, it moves from arterial compartment to a venous compartment or to the pulmonary circulation. The best example for that will be aortic regurgitation where the blood doesn't stay in the aorta during diastole, rather the blood comes back into the left ventricle during diastole because of the regurgitant valve. And it can occur in PDA also. Why in PDA? Because uh, in PDA, uh, the blood flows from aorta into the pulmonary circulation. So that's the reason blood doesn't stay over there. So then PDA also you can have a central runoff or in any AV fistulas, blood doesn't stay in the central circulation. It flows from artery to veins, right? So that's the reason. And we have something called iatopulmonary window. In this condition, also the blood flows from iatra to the pulmonary artery. So these are the mechanisms of central runoff. What, what is the reason for peripheral runoff? That is because of reduced systemic vascular resistance. And this is because of peripheral vasodilatation. To be honest, all of these conditions can produce peripheral runoff as well. All of these conditions which we have talked about central runoff can also produce peripheral runoff because of significant vasodilation. But any hyperdynamic state can produce collapsing pulse via peripheral runoff. So if they ask about causes of collapsing pulse, it's not about only these conditions. Even hyperdynamic states like fever, pregnancy, beriberi, thyrotoxicosis, AV fistula, Paget's disease. We have discussed so many things, right? Severe anemia. So all these conditions can produce peripheral runoff. And because of that also, uh, you can result in uh, a kind of a collapsing pulse. Dr. Tina is asking, what is the difference between PD and AP window? So very simple. Let me draw easy diagram. So this is aorta. So here is your pulmonary artery. So you know, uh, this is a connection between aorta and left pulmonary artery or main pulmonary artery. That is like patent ductus arteriosus. So the blood flows from aorta into the pulmonary artery via this ductus. That's PDA. In AP window, what happens is there will be a communication. Let us assume the pulmonary artery like this. In AP window, there will be a very proximal communication between aorta and pulmonary artery. So it's kind of a relatively distal communication in patients with PDA. But when, uh, but in AP window, in aorta pulmonary window, there's a very proximal communication right at the origin of the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So this is AP window. So you think where the blood flow to the pulmonary circulation will be more in AP window or in PDA? where the blood flow to the pulmonary circulation will be more? Proximal communications or distal communications? Where it will be more? Who's going to answer correctly? No, 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 no. Definitely it's going to be AP window. It's a proximal communication, right? So at least in uh, your uh, PDA, the blood flows into different arteries like brachiocephalic trunk, carotid, subclavian. It goes everywhere. Then only the remaining blood only goes into the pulmonary artery, pulmonary circulation. But in AP window, all, every single drop of blood that is going via the aorta has to pass through the communication. So that's the reason why the blood flow is going to be more in patients with AP window. So that's why they develop pulmonary hypertension faster. Difference between pulses parvus and pulses parvus at TARDIS. I'll come back to that. We haven't discussed yet. We haven't discussed yet. We'll come back about pulses parvus at TARDIS. So collapsing pulse. So now you know what is the reason for Watson's water hammer pulse. Now next is Pulses alternance. Pulses alternance. Pulses alternance will be seen in patients with severe left ventricular failure. And the closely related pulse is pulses by Gemini. Pulses by Gemini. So what is the reason for pulses by Gemini? Ventricular by Gemini. The usual reason for pulses by Gemini is dejection toxicity. Digitalis toxicity is the one that's going to produce pulses by Gemini commonly. So in both these conditions, uh, one, I mean, one beat will be strong and one beat will be weak. So in alternating strong and weak beats are common in both alternates as well as bigemini. And you know, ventricular bigemini is basically kind of uh, VPCs. For example, what is bigemini? Ventricular bigemini, you have a normal sinus beat. You're going to have a ventricular premature contraction, normal sinus beat, ventricular premature contraction, a normal sinus beat and a ventricular premature contraction and so on. So this is what is going to occur, right? 
but uh, in uh, pulses alternance, it's actually the sinus speed. That's what you need to know. In pulses alternance, so basically it's a kind of a normal sinus speed. So what's the big difference you saw? So obviously here one beat will be small. I mean, one beat will be strong and one beat will be weak. That's all right. And here also one beat will be strong and one beat will be weak. So which beat will be weaker here? Usually the VPC, the ventricular premature contraction will be the weaker beat. The normal sinus beat will be the stronger beat. But can you tell me the difference? Both is going to produce alternating strong and weak pulses, weak beats. But what is the big difference between them? Can you tell the difference? If you look at this diagram, you might be able to understand things better. So what is the big difference over here? What's the big difference? No, 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 no. That's not the big difference. You can see uh, here also you're having a strong beat and a weak beat. And you're having, this is a bigeminy basically. Here also you're having a strong beat and a weak beat. But you're seeing pulses alternates. I mean, the clue lies in which is due to arrhythmia, which is due to kind of an arrhythmia. Alternates are bigeminy, which is basically due to arrhythmia. Not the QRS, basically. We're talking about pulse. We're not talking about ECG. By Gemini is a kind of an arrhythmia, right? So technically, which is going to be irregular, man? Which is going to be irregular? By Gemini or alternates? Of course, by Gemini. By Gemini is going to have irregularity. You can see that there is a definite irregular pulse, right? So by Gemini is going to be irregular. In fact, it's going to produce a regularly irregular pulse. Whereas classically, alternates will be a regular pulse. Alternates will be regular. Whereas by Gemini will be a regularly irregular pulse. You would have studied in your first year physiology itself. One of the classic cause of regularly irregular pulses, pulses by Gemini, that is VPC. So that's how you have to find out. So alternance is basically an alternating strong and weak pulse with regularity, whereas by Gemini will be alternating strong and weak pulse with irregularity. There will be a regularly irregular pulse. That's how you differentiate in practice. What is by Gemini and what is alternance? And number three. So, I mean, apart from that, there is something called double peaking pulse. This is a very important topic. So there's another character that's called as double beating pulse. Double beating pulse can be divided into two. So where you see is both the peaks in systole, systolic beats, and you can see a systolic beat and a diastolic beat. Systolic beat and a diastolic beat. So double peaking pulse with both beats beating in systole can be further divided into anacrotic pulse. And we have something called as bisphereans pulse. Bisphereans pulse. If you have a one systolic beat and one diastolic beat, it's often referred to as dichrotic pulse. It's often referred to as dichrotic pulse. So what is anacrotic pulse? In anacrotic pulse, you're going to have a prominent anacrotic notch. Prominent anacrotic notch. Okay, that's what we called as anacrotic pulse. So what is happening here is the anacrotic notch, which is normally not very much palpable, becomes palpable, becomes palpable now. Anacrotic notch becomes very much palpable. And of course, you will be able to palpate the percussion wave also and the peak also. So this is what we called as anacrotic pulse, prominent anacrotic notch, where you see that in patients with severe aortic stenosis. More severe the aortic stenosis is, more will be the uh, anacrotic notch. More palpable will be the anacrotic notch. So in aortic stenosis, what you're going to see is a kind of a small volume. If you look at the normal pulse, let us draw the normal pulse over here. Anacrotic notch is not palpable. Normal carotid pulse is going to be something like that. But what you're noticing in an anachronic pulse is you're having a diminished peak. The peak is small. You're having a very small peak. Small peak. This is what we call as pulses parvus. A small diminished volume of the pulse with a small peak. And along with that, the peak is delayed or peak is very fast here because of hydrix noise. I told you the peak is also delayed. You can notice that the peak is delayed. You're having a kind of a delayed peak, right? So this is what we called as classic pulses parvus at tardis. Parvus is a small volume pulse at there. It's a retarded pulse with a delayed peak. It's a retarded pulse with a delayed and a prolonged peak. That's what we called as pulses parvus at tardis. Classically seen in patients with severe aortic stenosis. So what about bisphereans pulse? Bisphereans pulse is a kind of a double beating pulse, but you're going to see Anacrotic notch, not very prominent though. And you'll be seeing two beats like this in systole. So this is completely different. So you're going to have twice beating, but it's not due to prominent anacrotic notch. 
So this is what we called as bisphereance pulse. There are two types of bisphereance pulse. One that is seen in severe AR, classic cause, or sometimes it can be seen in AS plus severe AR also. But the classic condition that causes bisphereance pulse is severe AR. You can notice that in the collapsing pulse itself, I think most of you can notice the bisphereance pulse, bisphereance nature. There is a two peak over here. So in normal situations, you don't see two peaks. But in moderate air, it starts to appear. But in severe air, that is where you see the classic bisphereance pulse with two peaks over here. Apart from that, AS plus AR also can produce bisphereance pulse, but definitely not a pure AS. Pure AS can never produce a bisphereance pulse. And another condition that produces bisphereance pulse-like condition is HOCM, that is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, where again, you're going to see the bisphereance nature, like what you're seeing here. So there is a definite bisphereance pulse, but here the peaks are irregular and peaks are not uh, equal. Here you are having unequal peaks. In the routine bisphereance pulse, you had an equal peak, but here you're having unequal peak. This is often referred to as spike and dome appearance. In exam, whenever they ask you where you'll see spike and dome kind of a pulse, you have to answer that you're going to see in patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Very, very important. So this kind of Spike and dome pulse is also referred to as jerky pulse. That's the other name given to HOCM pulse. In clinical practice, we call that as jerky pulse. But nevertheless, bisphereance, spike and dome appearance, it is HOCM. Bisphereance, no spike and dome appearance, answer severe AR or probably AS plus AR, but never severe AS. In severe AS, what you're going to see is only anachronic pulse with the pulses parvus at tardus. So that's why it's important. Okay. So what about dichrotic pulse? In dichrotic pulse, you're going to have one peak in systole and another peak in diastole, which means what is happening here is the dichrotic notch is becoming prominent. That's all. So that is basically anachrotic pulse. What's that to repeat? I don't know. So I told you that in severe AR, you're going to see both the peaks equal in systole, but in HOCM, you will see unequal peaks. You will not see equal peaks. One, both two peaks will be there, but uh, you're going to have a kind of a spike and a dome kind of an appearance, which is also called as jerky pulse. In exam, I told you, if you have a bisphereance with spike and dome appearance or a jerky appearance, you're going to answer it is called as HOCM. Otherwise, you're going to answer only severe AR, but not aortic stenosis. Okay, coming to dichrotic pulse. Explain normal pulse. After this long, <laughs> cerebral... He's asking, explain normal pulse. We have discussed so much. So what, what is the problem with normal pulse here? We already discussed so much about normal pulse. I think he has not um, attended the time when we are when you have been discussing about normal pulse. So just for your sake, I'll tell one more time. No worries about that. So you have a percussion wave, you have anachronic notch, you have the like uh, percussion wave that is palpable, that's called as the peak. Then you get the tidal wave, which is the reflected wave. Then we have the dichrotic notch. Then you have something called as the dichrotic wave. So this is the normal pulse. We are going to call it as catachrotic pulse. Okay, no worries about that. Now coming back to the dichrotic pulse. What is dichrotic pulse? Dichrotic pulse uh, is something that you have a prominent dichrotic notch, which means you have a prominent dichrotic notch. So that's why we're going to call it as dichrotic pulse. So what could be the reason for the prominent dichrotic notch? So there are two reasons. Either the diastolic wave becomes prominent. So the elastic recoil of IATA or something in the IATA is there that is making the dichrotic notch prominent. That could be one reason. Or because the systolic peak is coming down, because the systolic peak is coming down, you're having a like relative prominence of the diastolic pulse. So this is relative. So because one is coming down, the other becomes very prominent. So that's how it is. So that is diastolic pulse. So let us assume there are two toppers in the class. So the first one is always, I mean, let, let us not two toppers. Let us assume a topper in the class uh, who is always ahead of everyone. So he's rank one and there is someone who's rank two. And let us assume there is always a gross difference between rank one and rank two. He scores very nicely. But due to some reason, this person is not attending the exam because of fever or something. This person is not attending the exam who is a topper. Now what happens suddenly this fellow becomes the topper because that fellow is not attending the exam and is having fever. So this is called as relative prominence. So because the systolic peak sometimes may be diminished, your diastolic peak, that dichrotic notch can become very prominent. And that's what we call it as dichrotic pulse, a double beating pulse. So what conditions where the systolic peak can come down any shock states, including heart failure. So heart failure can produce alternance, it can produce small volume hypokinetic pulse, and it can produce a kind of a dichrotic pulse also in some situations. Shock. 
characteristically in cardiogenic shock lv failure also you can have this kind of uh, dichrotic pulse sometimes and sometimes in sepsis classic condition that will be given in older medicine textbooks is typhoid fever because in india typhoid is very common so what is the reason in typhoid in typhoid there will be peripheral vasodilation because of that the peaks will come down so relative prominence so you get this kind of prominent dichrotic pulse and apart from that there is a device called as iabp that is intraartic balloon counterpulsation you know what 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 is the mechanism of iabp there will be a balloon in the aorta that balloon will expand during diastole and it will collapse during systole it's a kind of a therapeutic technique that we perform in certain situations like cardiogenic shock so because the balloon expands in diastole the diastolic pressure increases in the aorta that's actually the mechanism of intraartic balloon counterpulsation iabp so that's the reason why in iabp also the peak can be very prominent the diastolic wave can become very prominent so these are the like uh, typical examples of different pulse characters i think uh, here is where you are noticing the typical prominent anachronic notch with a diminished peak and a delayed peak this is classic pulses parvus at tardus seen in severe arteric stenosis and here is where you are seeing the double peaking pulse in systole equal typically seen in severe arteric regurgitation bisphereans pulse you are seeing a spike and dome appearance where you gonna see in patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and you are seeing a prominent dichrotic notch this is nothing but a dichrotic pulse seen in patients with sepsis and uh, patients were having lv failure and so on so this is a dichrotic pulse i think that's it about pulse i don't think you need to know anything much about it now coming back to jugular venous pulse so there will be some questions on jvp and jugular venous pulse so you have to be very clear about that in textbooks they will confuse you between millimeters of mercury and uh, centimeters of water so how will you can i mean can convert first let me tell you that so this is a common question that's asked in most of the exam uh, especially the final year board exams and even in the md level board exam they tend to ask how will you convert uh, the millimeters of mercury to centimeters of water so technically 1.36 cm of water is equivalent to 1 mm of mercury so 1.36 cm of water is going to be equivalent to 1 mm of mercury okay so this of you convert cm of water to mm of mercury so what is the normal jvp normal jvp is technically less than 8 cm of water or we can say it's going to be less than 6 mm of mercury so normal jvp is less than 8 cm of water or we can say less than 6 mm of mercury so jvp is going to be approximately equivalent to right atrial pressure so jvp is going to be approximately equivalent to right atrial pressure so whatever the right atrial pressure changes are happening that's going to be reflected as jvp changes as well so you know how will you measure jvp simply i'll tell you you are going to see the sternal i mean from the sternal height you're going to see the jvp technically 45 degree angle but this angle is not very important but classic situation in exam what you're going to do when you are in front of an examiner you're going to ask the patient to lie down and the bed will be at 45 degree angle ask the patient to slightly not completely slightly turn their neck towards the left side and you're going to see the right ijv for the jvp not the left ijv that's very important right ijv and uh, you can see the pulsations and that height you will measure from the sternal angle and that height plus 5 cm because that's very important because right atrium is 5 cm below it so whatever height you are seeing from the sternal angle to the jvp you are going to measure with a scale and that height plus you will add another 5 cm of water that's going to give the ultimate jvp this is the uh, way of how to measure a jugular venous pressure in exams clear so what is the normal jvp waveform so it's very important right what's the normal jvp waveform so you're going to have waveforms like this okay so this is a typical description of a normal waveform you're going to have a wave c wave x descent v wave and you're going to have something called as y descent so you all know what is the reason for the a wave the reason for the a wave is nothing but atrial contraction reason for a wave is atrial contraction everyone knows that so what is the reason for the c wave the reason for the c wave is isovolumetric ventricular contraction isovolumetric ventricular contraction usually it will not be like visualized it's very difficult to visualize and you know what is the reason for the x descent x descent is because of two reasons one reason is atrial relaxation during atrial diastole atrial relaxation during atrial diastole plus at the same time there is rapid ejection phase of the ventricle so rapid ejection phase of the ventricle is going to produce 
X descent. So why rapid ejection phase? Because during rapid ejection phase, the ventricle will become short. It's going to contract and that contraction is not only going to shorten the ventricles, it's also simultaneously going to pull the atrial floor downward towards the right ventricle. So because the atrial cavity expands by Boyle's law, your pressure is going to drop. And that is what, that is the reason for the X descent in the first place. So two things, atrial relaxation along with rapid ejection phase of the ventricular contraction is also going to contribute to the X descent. And what's the reason for the V wave? So V wave is basically because of the venous filling. It occurs during the slow ejection phase where there is no further ventricular shortening, but there is contraction, but there is no much pulling of the atrial floor downward. Plus at the same time, there is filling of the right atrium by SVC and IVC. So basically I can say it's because of venous filling. Venous filling of whom? Venous filling of right atrium by the great veins like SVC and IVC that's going to produce the V wave. And then we have something called as the Y descent. So what is the reason for the Y descent? Y descent is technically due to uh, opening of the tricuspid valve. That's going to result in blood gushing into the ventricles. So this occurs during ventricular diastole. Or more technically, I can say it's going to occur during early part of the ventricular diastole during the rapid passive filling phase. You know, during the uh, ventricular diastole, you have three phases, rapid passive filling, slow passive filling, and then finally, you're going to have something called atrial kick. So this is going to occur during the early rapid passive filling phase. That's where you get the Y descent. And one thing you have to clearly notice is that the height of the A wave is always bigger than the height of the V wave. Whenever the height of the V wave is bigger than the A wave, that's where we call it as like V wave is large. That's a very important point. And you have to notice that the X descent is always steeper than the Y descent. X descent is always steeper than the Y descent. And whenever Y descent is steeper than the X descent, I'm going to say that the X descent is attenuated or diminished. So A wave always is taller than the V wave and X descent should be always steeper than the Y descent. If something else happens, then we can call it as either large V wave or we can call it as an attenuated X descent or a large Y wave or a whatever it is. So that's how it is. So that's why this is very, very important for exams. And what are the problems of the A wave? In exam, they will definitely ask. So what are the problems of the A wave that they're going to deal with? First thing we have discussed so many times, whenever you have absent A wave, it usually indicates something called as atrial fibrillation that everyone knows. Whenever you're going to have large A wave, large A wave, usually only two conditions, either it must be a RV inflow obstruction, RV inflow obstruction, or it must be a RV outflow tract obstruction. So what is the usual reason for RV inflow obstruction? Tricuspid stenosis, RV inflow obstruction. So what are the what is the usual reason for RV outflow tract obstruction? It could be a pulmonic stenosis or any condition that produces pulmonary hypertension. So in exam, you have to know this these two causes classically. Whenever there is a tricuspid stenosis or pulmonary hypertension, you're going to have a large A wave. Then we have something called as Canon A waves. Canon A waves, which are very large A waves technically, Canon A waves. So what are the um, causes of Canon A waves? So we have to think about first, it's a regular Canon A wave or irregular Canon A wave. Both can be asked in exam. Regular Canon A wave is typically due to SVT, typically due to SVT, especially AVNRT. So first of all, understand that Canon A waves occur whenever atrium contracts against a closed tricuspid valve. Whenever atrium contracts against a closed tricuspid valve, you get a Canon A wave. Which means technically what I'm trying to say is atrium and ventricle, whenever they contract together, usually atrium and ventricle should not contract together. Atrium and ventricle should contract sequentially. Okay, not simultaneously. Whenever there is simultaneous atrium and ventricular contraction, obviously atrium cannot win. Ventricle is going to win. It's going to close the tricuspid valve and atrium will be contracting against a closed tricuspid valve that's going to produce a cannon shot, cannon A wave. This typically occurs in AV and RT with every pulse like atrium and ventricle contract together. So that's why in a, uh, SVT, like AV and RT, uh, you have that cannon A waves regularly with every heartbeat. And this is going to translate into a clinical sign. Can anyone say what is it going to translate into clinical sign? So what clinical sign that you see? You have a special name for that. Who's going to answer me? <laughs> Dr. Ali, like, great. I'm so happy with you. So that's called frog sign. Yes, that's correct. So that's going to clinically translate into frog sign. Regular canon AVS is going to translate into frog sign in practice. So you can notice like in patients with AVNRT sometimes. And uh, what about uh, irregular canon A waves? Irregular canon A waves technically is going to uh, be associated with something called as AV dissociation. That's where you see irregular canon A waves. 
So what are the conditions that produce AV dissociation in exam? Only two conditions, complete art block, that is third degree AV block and ventricular tachycardia. As simple as that. Complete art block and ventricular tachycardia. In exam, when you have a bradycardia with irregular cannabis, think about complete art block. If you have a tachycardia with irregular cannabis, think about uh, ventricular tachycardia. That's it. Brady, irregular cannabis, complete art block, tachy, uh, irregular cannabis, bradycardia. I'm sorry, tachy, irregular cannabis, ventricular tachycardia. So, Dr. Serendipity is asking, what is proxen? So, I told you, what happens with AVNRT? In AVNRT, what happens is the P waves and the QRS complex are going to occur simultaneously. So, if you look at the AVNRT um, like waveform, okay? So, let us assume this is AVNRT in lead 2. So, in lead 2, what happens in the setting of AVNRT? You're going to have P waves superimposed with every QRS. That's the mechanism. I'm not here to discuss the AVNRT as such, but this is what is happening in AVNRT. You're going to have a QRS along with it. You're going to have a P wave that's superimposed over every single QRS. So, because the P waves are superimposed over QRS in AVNRT, you're going to have atrial contraction and ventricular contraction together with each and every heartbeat. So, because atrium and ventricle contracts together, what happens is JVP is going to rise like anything because atrium anyway can't win. The tricuspid valve would have closed and atrium is basically contracting against a closed tricuspid valve that's going to cause a massive rise in pressure within the right atrium that's going to transfer into both the jugular veins. So, both the jugular veins is going to produce this kind of like increasing, I mean, a cannon shots with every heartbeat, right? So, you know, like frogs during winter, and during uh, the rainy seasons, especially, they produce that kind of peculiar signs, isn't it, to attract the female frogs. The male frogs tend to do that by uh, 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 enlarging their vocal cords, and they produce that peculiar sound everyone would have noticed. So that's why this is also called as froxin, because both the sites, the jugular venous pressure is going to increase during the uh, heartbeat. Do you understand? Yes or no? So that regular cannon waves, clinically, it's going to translate into something called as froxin. Are you understanding? Because of heart block, you get irregular cannabis. Because what happens in AV dissociation is only occasionally uh, your P waves and QRS will superimpose. In AVNRT, there will be regular superimposition. But in uh, AV, I mean AV dissociation, the P waves occasionally, every now and then, not every beat, every now and then they're going to have a superimposed P wave over the QRS. That time only atrium and ventricle will contract together. So that's when AV dissociation, you, you see that cannon shots every now and then. So that's why it's called as irregular cannon waves. Hope you understand. So these are the problems due to A waves. So what are the problems due to V waves? You're going to have large V wave. If at all I ask you, what is the reason for large V wave? What are you going to answer? What are you going to answer if you're going to have a large V wave? Technically. So what is the reason for V-wave? Uh, V-wave is basically due to uh, venous filling of the left right atrium, right? So whenever the filling of the right atrium increases, so the venous filling of the right atrium increases, so what can fill the right atrium? So technically in TR, the right ventricle is filling the right atrium excessively classic cause. And you can see this in constrictive pericarditis, which is basically a volume overloaded state where the pericardium is not allowing the ventricles to fill properly. So that's the reason you have excessive volume in the right atrium. And um, you can see large V wave in patients with uh, ASD also, because in ASD, the blood flows from left side to right side. So technically, LA is going to fill the right atrium in excess in ASD. And you can see in conditions like TAPVC, that is total anomalous pulmonary venous connection, where pulmonary veins are abnormally connected to the right atrium in this case. So here, basically, the pulmonary veins are filling the right atrium in excess. So these are the classic conditions that produces uh, large views. And of course, any hyperdynamic state, yes, by default, Tina is correct. Any hyperdynamic state by default can produce a large view because of the excessive circulation in hyperdynamic states. So these are the usual cause of large view. And what about uh, X descent? When you talk about X descent, so you need to know conditions that cause accentuated or increased X descent or a prominent X descent, conditions that produce an attenuated or a diminished X descent or even an absent X descent. What are the conditions that produce a prominent X descent? Only two conditions, constrictive pericarditis and, sorry, what, what does produce a prominent, prominent, prominent X descent? Only two conditions. One is constrictive pericarditis, yes, second is cardiac tamponade. So one is going to be constrictive pericarditis, second condition is going to be cardiac tamponade. Only two conditions, yes, that's correct. These two conditions produce a prominent X descent. We discussed that already, right? So many times. What is the mnemonic for that? So we have discussed that. 
I mean, so many classes, even in a regular classes, in rapid revision, even in previous classes, I told you. So we use a mnemonic called as pay tax, right? So in constrictive pericarditis, the most important change in JVP is prominent white descent. In constrictive pericarditis, you notice something called as prominent white descent, which is also referred to as Friedrich sign. Which is also referred to as Friedrich sign. On the other hand, in cardiac tamponade, in cardiac tamponade, you see a prominent X descent. You see something called as prominent X descent in patients with cardiac tamponade. But remember, in tamponade, classic change, as I told you, is prominent X descent with a diminished Y descent. But the prominent X descent is the most important. But in constrictive pericarditis, you're going to have a prominent Y descent with a prominent X descent. Both will be increased. But even though this is very important for exams, prominent Y descent and prominent X descent. But don't think like in cardiac constrictive pericarditis, the X descent will be diminished or attenuated. X descent also is going to be prominent in patients with constrictive pericarditis. All right. So what are the conditions that causes attenuated X descent? Attenuated X descent. So three conditions will produce attenuated X descent. One is tricuspid regurgitation. Very, very important. You will not have X descent at all. In most cases of severe TR, X will be lost and there will be a CV fusion. In tricuspid regurgitation, the X descent won't be there. And only AV will be there, CV will be there, and the VV will be large. So X descent will be lost, and there's going to be a smooth CV fusion. This is because of the regurgitant jet that is coming from the right ventricle. So this is typical of tricuspid regurgitation. Other two conditions include like constrictive pericarditis to some extent, where uh, your uh, X descent can be not constrictive pericarditis, sorry, right heart failure, where your X descent can be diminished in restricted cardiomyopathy, yes. And in patients with atrial fibrillation, also you're going to have a attenuated extension, but the most important condition for exam is going to be tricuspid regurgitation. And then coming to wide descent. When it comes to wide descent, so you can have both prominent wide descent as well as diminished wide descent or attenuated wide descent. So what are the conditions that produce prominent wide descent? Prominent wide descent will be seen in conditions where you have a prom a attenuated extension. What are those conditions? Where is the attenuated X descent? Yes, tricuspid regurgitation, right heart failure, and constrictive pericarditis. These are the conditions that are going to have a, a prominent Y descent. Prominent Y descent, we know that. And diminished X descent, Y descent will be seen in patients with cardiac tamponade. We know that. Cardiac tamponade are going to have a diminished Y descent along with that in tricuspid stenosis, another important condition. Because of RV inflow difficulty, your wide descent will be diminished. You know, the reason for wide descent is basically the movement of the blood from the RA into RV. So that rapid passive filling of the ventricle. So if there is some problem like tricuspid stenosis or if there is fluid around the heart that is collapsing the right ventricle, which is not allowing the ventricle to get filled properly. So wide descent will be diminished. So that's why these are the classic causes. Diminished wide descent will be seen in patients with tricuspid stenosis and in patients with Cardiac tamperon, very important for exams. Prominent wide descent, you know, the most important cause is basically your TR along with constrictive pericarditis. In constrictive pericarditis, if you see a prominent wide descent, I told you so many times, that's also called as Friedrich sign. So now let us have a look at some of the important JVP images that can be asked in exam. So first one is the normal JVP. As I told you, the A wave should be prominent than the V wave and the X descent should be prominent than the Y descent. We know that. And in patients with constrictive pericarditis, you're going to have prominent X descent as well as prominent Y descent. That is why in exam, if they give, where you see this M's and W's? This looks like M and W, right? So this looks like M or in other way, if you see, this looks like W. So if they ask you, you see JVP in the form of M's and W's, answer is constrictive pericarditis. This prominent Y descent in constrictive pericarditis is what we call as Friedrich sign. And what about cardiac tamponade? In cardiac tamponade, you're going to have um, kind of a, Attenuated A wave, the A wave will not be prominent at all. One of the important causes of small A wave is pericardial tamponade because of the RA collapse. You won't have a big R wave, A wave at all. But what is seen very prominently is the prominent X descent. You can see how prominent the X descent is. And you can also notice, see that the Y descent is diminished. The Y descent is diminished, Y descent is not prominent. This combination of a prominent X descent with the attenuated Y descent is typical of ta cardiac tamponade. And what happens in uh, severe tricuspid regurgitation? As I told you, you're not going to have the X descent. There will be attenuation of X descent. And you're going to have a large V wave with a CV fusion. With a CV fusion. You're going to have the fusion of the C wave with the V wave. 
This TR jet producing CV fusion sometimes can elevate the JVP so much so that it can produce some earlobe pulsations. This earlobe pulsations that is seen in patients with severe TR because of the CV fusion is also called as Lancisi sign clinically. So that's also called as Lancisi sign, which is nothing but the CV fusion wave that is causing earlobe pulsations in some patients with TR, Lancisi sign. And you can also notice that in severe TR, there is a prominent Y descent. So absent X descent with the CV fusion, large V wave and a prominent Y descent is characteristic of severe TR. And you can notice that in tricuspid stenosis, uh, there is a slow Y descent. There is a slow Y descent and together you are having a large A wave. So whenever there is a large A wave with a slow Y descent, you're going to think about tricuspid stenosis. Why? Because of RV inflow obstruction. Because of RV inflow obstruction, the RA pressures will increase during contraction. So large A wave. And because the blood movement into RV is going to be slow, it's going to produce a slow Y descent or attenuated Y descent. So what happens in atrial septal defect? In atrial septal defect, you're going to have a large V wave. That's the most important finding. V wave is going to be large because uh, it's not only the vent, the right atrium is not only filled by your left atrium. I mean, not only filled by SVC and IVC, it's also filled by the left atrium. More venous return to the right atrium. That's why you're going to have a large V wave. And this is what you're going to notice in complete AV block. So what happens in complete AV block? You're going to see cannon A waves. And it will be irregular or regular. It will be an irregular cannon A wave. Because in complete heart block and ventricular tachycardia, you will have a uh, AV dissociation. And that's going to produce only irregular cannon A waves. So you can see here the A wave is fine. At some places, the A wave is fine. But at only some places, the A waves are very, very prominent. So these are cannon shots. And these are basically irregular cannon A waves seen in patients with AV dissociation like complete heart block. And in atrial fibrillation, you, you, you're not even having an A wave, right? There's no A wave at all. On top of that, you're also noticing a prominent white descent, which can also be seen in patients with atrial fibrillation. So basically, that is a kind of a um, atrial fibrillation patient with prominent white descent and an absent A wave. So the basic characteristic feature of atrial fibrillation is absent A wave. So if, if you know that, that is more than enough. And here is another case with constrictive pericarditis we are seeing a prominent X and Y descent. Why I've shown this is because I told you JVP will be seen in the form of M's and W's. I think everyone can notice that M's and W's. In exam, if at all they mention, JVP is full of M's and W's, one of the old names questions. Answer is going to be constrictive pericarditis. So that's the right answer for this JVP. Okay, have you understood JVP? Yes. So all the waveforms, what all can be asked in exams? Yes or no? Yes. Oh, cool. Okay. So there are two things which I want to explain more. So one is called as Kusmal sign. Kusmal sign. So what is Kusmal sign? You know, JVP decreases during inspiration and comes back to baseline during expiration. So if you don't have any respiratory variation, normally JVP should decrease during inspiration, but if it doesn't change, if you have absent respiratory variation, in jugular venous pressure waveforms, this is what we call as Kussmaul sign. Classic example is constrictive pericarditis, but it can be seen in patients with restrictive cardiac myopathy. Also, it can be seen in patients with cardiac tamponade also, but in exam, you have to answer only one thing that is constrictive pericarditis. That's all. That's the first thing that should come into your mind. So if you don't have any respiratory variation in JVP, if the JVP remains flat or paradoxically, if the JVP increases with inspiration, that is what we call as Kussmaul sign. And next, we have something called hepatojugular reflex. So what are you going to do? You're going to give pressure on the right hypochondrium. That's going to press on the IVC. That's going to increase the venous return to the right side. So that is going to produce a kind of a transient increase in JVP, but not a sustained increase. When you call it as hepatojugular reflex is positive, if the JVP, it is positive if the JVP increases by more than 3 centimeters of water from the baseline value, plus it is increased for a sustained duration of more than 15 seconds. So it's not only about increasing the JVP by more than 3 centimeters of water. It would also be increased for a sustained duration of more than 15 seconds. Then you can call it as a positive hepatojugular reflex. Usually it indicates an occult right ventricular failure. So whenever there is some occult right ventricular failure, you're going to have a positive hepatojugular reflex. So in exam, they might also ask which condition you will have a positive hepatojugular reflex. I mean, sorry, increased JVP, significant increase in jugular venous pressure 
but with absent epidojugular reflex. JVP is increased, but you're having absent epidojugular reflex. Which condition? Anyone can answer? Very common question, easy one in exam. They tend, regularly tend to ask this. JVP is elevated, distended jugular venous pressure, distended jugular veins, but you don't have epidojugular reflex. What is that condition? Negative epidojugular reflex, absent epidojugular reflex, no increase in the JVP with right hypochondrial pressure. SVC obstruction. Okay, in exam, they will ask you this, SVC obstruction. Why SVC obstruction? Because in SVC obstruction, the increase in the right atrial pressure or increase in the right atrial volume or right ventricle cannot be transmitted to the JVP in the first place. Because of obstruction, JVP will be high. But because the pressure changes cannot be transmitted because of obstruction at the SVC level, you won't have any uh, epidojugular reflex at all. And in SVC obstruction, not only this finding will be there, there will be absent waveforms. JVP will be elevated, but it will be a dead JVP. In the sense, you don't have any waveforms, no A wave, no V wave, because these waveforms reflect pressure changes in the right atrium. So if you have SVC obstruction, none of these pressure changes can be transmitted to the jugular venous, I mean, internal jugular vein. So that's the reason why you're going to have a kind of absent waveforms. So these are the characteristic features of SVC obstruction. Again, very commonly asked in exam. Coming to heart sounds. So when it comes to heart sounds, you have... Uh, the first four important heart sounds, you have first heart sound that is S1, then we have S2, then we have S3, then we have S4. Let me tell you like uh, in a nutshell, in a quick review. So what, what is the important thing about S1? When it comes to S1, so the split in S1 is also there, but the intensity of S1 is more important. When it comes to S1, the intensity of S1 is almost always important. So that is where it's important. When it comes to intensity of S1, so it can be loud or it can be soft. So first of all, we need to know what are the cause of loud S1. So to be honest, the most common reason for loud S1 in the community is hyperdynamic state. Whatever hyperdynamic state that you have discussed so far can result in a loud first heart sound. Apart from that, valve problems like MS and TS, you know, it can produce loud S1. And apart from that, PR interval of less than 120 milliseconds, which means a short PR. You know what is the classic cause of short PR? It's Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Everyone knows that. So short PR, especially in Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, you can have a loud S1. Apart from that, whenever the inflow to the tricuspid increase flow across tricuspid or mitral valve. Whenever there's increased flow to tricuspid valve or mitral valve is there, you can have a loud S1 technically. Like for example, MR, ASD, VSD, all of these conditions technically can produce loud S1, but what is important for exam is going to be the short PR MSTS. This, these two are going to be the most important for exams. You cannot afford to miss this. So two important cause of loud S1. And what are the important cause of soft S1? So clinically speaking, the most important cause of soft S1 is going to be a regurgitant lesion that is called as MR. MR is a very, very important cause of soft S1. Apart from that, second most important cause is CCF, that is heart failure, any congestive cardiac failure. Because of poor ventricular contraction, you will not have sufficient force that can be generated to close the valve very effectively. So that's the reason you're going to have a soft S1. And apart from that, PR interval more than one, 200 milliseconds, that is a prolonged PR interval. Prolonged PR interval or any severe bradycardia. Any severe bradycardia can produce a soft S1. Apart from this, any patient who's having a calcific MS or a TS, if once the valve is calcified, you're going to have a soft S1 only. I think in uh, MS chapter itself, we have in the previous chapter on valvular heart disease itself, we have discussed on what could be the causes of, so I mean, what are the causes of soft S1 and MS? We have discussed it already. But in exam, don't forget MR, CCF, uh, prolonged PR and prolonged PR and calcific MS and TS. Please don't forget in exam. So all these are very important for exams, which can produce basically a kind of a soft S1. Then coming to second heart sound. So second heart sound means intensity is also important. And another thing that we have to look at is the split of the second heart sound. Both are basically important. So second heart sound should be called as A2P2. So we have two components of second heart sound, right? You have IOT component, you have the pulmonary component, A2 and P2. So when you talk about intensity, S2 can be loud or S2 can be soft. So loud means A2 can be loud or P2 can be loud. And soft means A2 can be soft and P2 can be soft because of that your second heart sound can be soft. So what are the conditions that produces a loud A2? So that you can have a 
loud S2 overall, hypertension, very, very important cause. That's going to produce a kind of a loud A2 and any root related causes or supravellar or subvellar A's can sometimes can produce loud A, especially supravellar A's. But more importantly, any aortic root problems, aortic root problems can produce a loud S2, aortic root problems. Because if there is like dilated root, it's going to recoil back with a lot of force. The aortic root is dilated so much. You all know that it's going to recoil back with a heavy force. So that's the reason anything that causes dilation of the aortic root. Like for example, ascending aortic aneurysm. Whenever it AOA, it means aortic aneurysm. Especially if you have an ascending aortic aneurysm, definitely like it's a kind of a dilated root. So it's going to recoil with a lot of force. So the valve will close very rapidly. So we're going to have a loud A2. And second characteristic reason is coarctation of aorta. In this condition also you can have a loud A2 because it's a root problem. Another cause of uh, loud A2 will be supravellar aortic stenosis. Very important cause. Supravellar aortic stenosis. So because of the obstruction above the valve, so the valve will close with a lot of force. AOA means aortic aneurysm. AOA. COA means coarctation of aorta. AOA means aortic aneurysm. And you know, AOD means aortic dissection. So these are the short forms that we write in practice. Nevertheless, supravellar AS, because obstruction is above, the valve will close faster with a lot of speed and a lot of force. That's the reason why you're going to have a loud A2 and loud S2. So classic cause of loud P2 is pulmonary hypertension. So similar to uh, loud A2, so a, 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 the reason for loud P2 will be pulmonary root problems. If there is any thing that causes dilation of the pulmonary root, you're going to have like uh, loud P2. But the classic cause is pulmonary hypertension. That's what you need to know. So systemic hypertension okay, is the cause of loud A2, causing loud S2. Pulmonary hypertension is the cause of loud P2. If you want to remember one thing, please don't forget loud P2 and pulmonary hypertension. Very important. Loud P2, palpable P2 in exam always is equal to pulmonary hypertension. So what about soft S2? Soft S2 can be due to soft A2 or it can be due to soft P2. So what are the reasons for soft A2? Valvular aortic stenosis. Valvular AS or AR is going to produce a soft A2 only. Whenever AS and AR is due to valvular cause. Valvular cause. Because usually, if it's a valvular cause, you're going to have calcified valve. In these conditions, the valve will be, aortic valve will be calcified. The most common cause of aortic stenosis is a calcified aortic valve. So that's, that's what is happening in elderly patients. That's why in valvular causes of AS and AR, generally A2 will be soft, very commonly asked in exam. And when P2 will be soft, whenever the patient is having valvular pulmonic stenosis or pulmonic regurgitation. We know already root causes will only produce loud P2. But if the patient is having a valvular pulmonic stenosis or pulmonic regurgitation, you're going to have a soft P2. Another very, very important cause. So if you know this much, it's more than enough. Now coming to splitting of the second heart sound. So let us assume the normal split is A2, P2 like this. You know, whenever A2 and P2 is widely split, this is called as wide splitting of the second heart sound. So if you have like A2, P2 like this, this is called as narrow split narrow split and if you have p2 followed by a2 this is called as reverse split or otherwise called as paradoxical split we all know that so how will you find out normal split this is normal right so that just arbitrarily we can take it as normal and you have to look at inspiration and expression both together if you are able to hear the split in inspiration but not during expression that is a normal split if you are able to hear the split in both inspiration and expression that is a kind of a wide split in practice if you're not able to hear the split in both inspiration and expression, that's kind of a narrow split. If you're able to hear the split in expiration, but not in inspiration, that is an example of a reverse splitting. So that's why I told. So these are the basic problems. And I've given the pictorial representation and I've told you how to find out in clinical practice as well. So this is how you find out whether it's a narrow, reversed, or probably a wide split. So what are the costs of wide split in practice? So this is a very common question exam. So where do you have a wide split? So wide split typically seen in patients with MR and VST, one condition, MR and VST. So what is the reason for wide split in MR and VST? You're going to have early A2. Because you're going to have an early A2 in MR and VST, you're going to have a wide split because A2 is early now. 
So because limited amount of blood only moves into aorta. Remaining blood either moves into left atrium in patients with MR or right ventricle in patients with VST. That's the reason why you're going to have a white split over here. So where P2 can be delayed. So it can be due to delayed P2, right? So where P2 can be delayed, P2 can be delayed in patients who are having right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, like in those patients with, for example, early stages of pulmonic stenosis. Because of that, P2 may be delayed. Another electrical cause is going to be right bundle branch block. Because of slow depolarization of the right ventricle and delayed closure of the pulmonary valve, you're going to have delayed P2 in these conditions. That's why you're going to have a white, I mean, a white splitting of the second heart sound. In ASDS, that is because of delayed P2. Another condition, if you want, right, you can write ASD also. ASD also because of more blood flow across the pulmonic valve, you're going to have a white splitting of the second heart sound. Yes, absolutely fine. That's because of delayed P2. And what about narrow splitting of the Second heart sound, so simple, straightforward, narrow splitting of the second heart sound uh, usually will be due to either late A2 or it can be due to early P2. So what's the reason for early P2? It is because of your pulmonary hypertension, classic cause. In exam, whenever they say narrow splitting, always think about pulmonary hypertension as the first cause. So whenever the P2 is loud with narrow splitting of the second heart sound, in exam, pulmonary hypertension, unless proved otherwise. And apart from that, early late A2 may be due to LV outflow tract obstruction. Like for example, in AS and HOCM, because LV contracts for a long time in these conditions, you can have a late A2 and that can produce a narrow splitting. So what are the conditions that are associated with reversed splitting of the second heart sound? So reverse splitting is because of severe LVOT obstruction. Number one causes severe LVOT obstruction. Again, in AS and HOCM, if the Obstruction is severe LV contracts for a very long time so that A2 falls beyond P2, that's reverse splitting, or in patients with left bundle branch block because of very slow LV depolarization and late closure of A2, you're going to have a reverse splitting in patients with left bundle branch block. These are classic conditions where you're going to have like white splitting, narrow splitting, as well as reverse splitting. And final type of split is called as fixed splitting. So when we call it as fixed splitting, fixed splitting means if your split timing does not change with Valsalva. So whatever may be the split timing, if the split timing does not change with Valsalva manual. So this is where we are going to call it as reverse splitting. So whenever the split timing does not change with Valsalva, you call it as fixed split, classic condition, atrial septal defect. We are going to have wide fixed split and it can occur in right heart failure as well. There are plenty of other conditions which can produce like fixed splitting. But these are two classic, classic, classic conditions, ASD and right heart failure. So it produces fixed set splitting. No change in the split timing with Valsalva. That's what we call it as fixed set split. And coming to third heart sound, a quick review about third heart sound and fourth heart sound. What are the causes? So what is the reason for third heart sound? Third heart sound is basically due to excessive volume in the left ventricle. Increased ventricular volume. Simple in one word, if you want to say the pathophysiology, whenever the ventricular volume is more, that is the reason for the third heart sound. So third heart sound can be completely physiological. Completely physiological. So best example will be any hyperdynamic state like pregnancy. Pregnancy very commonly will see third heart sound. Young individuals, especially children, according to textbooks less than 35 years, third heart sound can be physiological. Or in any hyperdynamic states, any hyperdynamic states you can see third heart sound. In athletes, because of thick ventricle, in a very trained athlete, you will basically see fourth heart sound rather than third heart sound. Um, but still, yes, possible. Because if the uh, ventricle is hyperdynamic, but in a trained athlete, you won't see any extra sounds generally. If the athlete is well-trained, the heart will adapt in such a way that you don't get any extra heart sounds. That's completely different. So what are the cause of pathological third heart sound? Pathological, only one condition, heart failure. In heart failure, because the LV is not contracting properly, the volume in the ventricle will increase. So that's the reason why you get third heart sound. Very, very important cause. Any heart failure, especially LV failure or RV failure, you're going to get third heart sound depending on uh, which side the problem is. If it's LV failure, LV third heart sound, RV failure, RV third heart sound. And remember, MR and VSD can produce both physiological as well as pathological third heart sound. In early stages, when the ventricle is hyperdynamic but have not failed, you will hear only a physiological third heart sound. But as the disease progresses, the patient are going to end up with heart failure. That time, what you hear is pathological third heart sound. So MR and VSD is something that can produce both physiological as well as pathological third heart sound. That's why I'm writing somewhere in between MR and VSD. 
So pregnancy, young individuals, hyperdynamic states, heart failure, MRVST. So classic cause of third heart sound. So what is the reason for fourth heart sound? Fourth heart sound is because of stiff ventricle. Whenever the ventricle is stiff, especially when the ventricle is not having a good diastolic relaxation, you're going to get fourth heart sound. So what is the reason for fourth heart sound? It's the atrial kick. Atrial kick against the stiff ventricle that's going to produce the fourth heart sound. So technically, if there is LV or RV pressure overload, LV or RV, not volume overload, rather LV or RV pressure overload. So like in stenotic lesions, so which results in severe LVH or probably RVH can result in fourth heart sound. So typically, if there is a LVOT obstruction, like in patients with AS, HOCM, or in patients with hypertension where the LV afterload will be high. In this condition, because of LVH, you can hear a fourth heart sound. RVH will be typically due to right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Anything that produces RVH can produce right ventricular fourth heart sound. Like for example, in patients with pulmonic stenosis or in patients with pulmonary hypertension. So you can have a LV, RV fourth heart sound that is possible. And apart from that, acute MRNAR. Acute MRNAR because the ventricular complaints in acute situations will be poor. Here also you can... Uh, here a fourth heart sound. I think we have discussed about this already in the valvular heart disease section. I told you very important cause of S4 in valvular heart disease is acute MR and acute AR. Apart from AS, acute MR and acute AR also can produce fourth heart sound. Very, very important point. So these are the usual dynamics of fourth heart sound commonly asked in exam. What are the cause of fourth heart sound? So very really loose fourth heart sound. So you know that fourth heart sound is basically due to your atrial contraction, atrial kick. So where atrial contraction is going to be lost in patients with atrial fibrillation. Once the atrial fibrillation sets in, you will no longer be hearing the fourth heart sound. So atrial fibrillation will result in loss of fourth heart sound, very commonly asked in exam. Loss of S4. Atrial fibrillation is going to result in loss of fourth heart sound. Don't forget that. Because atrial contraction will be lost, fourth heart sound will be lost. Coming to the extra sounds. So what are the important extra sounds that you have to learn in practice? Just hold on one second. I'll just have my water. Sorry, guys. Um, okay. So what are the extra sounds? Extra sounds, you have something called a systolic sounds, you have diastolic sounds, and you have multiphasic sounds also. So systolic sounds uh, is basically because of opening of the semilunar valves. If the systolic sound is going to occur due to opening of the semilunar valves, it's called as ejection clicks. That's called as clicks, and classically, we're going to call it as something called as ejection clicks. Very, very important. So if it's not due to opening of the semilunar valves, it's called as non-ejection click. If it's due to opening of the seminar valves, it's called as ejection click. If it's not due to opening of the seminar valve, it's called as non-ejection click. So what is the classic cause of ejection click? It's going to be due to valvular AS or valvular PS. So if it's due to valvular AS or valvular PS, you're going to have a valvular ejection click. Valvular ejection click. Right? But to produce an ejection click, your valve should be pliable. It's same like that of opening snap only. To produce an opening snap, your valve should be pliable, right? If the valve is calcified, your opening snap will be lost. We have discussed already. Similarly, when the valve is calcified, your ejection click will not be there. Right? Ejection click is to opening of the similar valve where the valve is thick because it produces a sound. So can you tell me, in a calcific AS, you will hear an ejection click or not? In a calcific case, which is very common in elderly individuals, that's a common form of ACE, will you hear an ejection click? Valve ejection click, where the valve is calcified. Will you be able to hear? No, you will not be able to hear ejection click. So which type of ACE ejection click is common? Very commonly asked in exam. Which type of ACE? Another condition, it's a congenital condition that produces ACE very commonly in practice, in young individuals that will produce ejection click commonly. No, it's not rheumatic artists. It's basically bicuspid artic valve. Very, very important. Yes, very important cause. Bicuspid artic valve. Very common cause of aortic ejection click. So pulmonic ejection click can be seen in valvular PS. That's all right. In children and all. 
but typical condition that's going to produce like valvular aortic ejection click is bicuspid bicuspidatic valve. So that's a very important point. So why valvular ejection click is important in practice because it typically rules out supravalvular and subvalvular AS. If you hear ejection click, it rules out supravalvular and subvalvular causes of AS and PS. It's impossible because this kind of problems are common in children and young individuals. You have to rule out supravalvular and subvalvular causes, which is also common in young people. So the moment you hear a valvular ejection click, that rules out supravalvular and subvalvular causes. The lesion must be localized in the valvular level only. That's why it's important. So what about non-ejection click? The classic example of a non-ejection click, there are plenty of causes, but what is important for exams? Mitral valve prolapse. So what happens in mitral valve prolapse? You're going to have S1, you will have S2, S1, S2, and then you will have S1, S2, right? So in mitral valve prolapse, you will hear a click that will be a mid-systolic click. There will be a mid-systolic click. If at all you have a murmur, if you have a MR, if there is an associated MR, you are going to hear a late systolic murmur. This is typical of mitral valve prolapse. You will hear a mid-systolic click with a late systolic murmur. Because what's happening is the mitral valve, after it closes, it prolapses, prolapses, prolapses because of the redundant cordae. And that's going to produce or click sound and then it opens up gives away producing a late systolic murmur but the thing is many patients may have just mvp without mr so if you don't have mvp without mr you will just hear the click no murmur will be there if there is an acid mr you will have a classic late systolic murmur this is typical of mvp a classic cause of a non-ejection click in exams it's very important so what are the important diastolic sounds remember third heart sound and fourth heart sound are basically diastolic sounds third heart sound as well as fourth heart sound are basically diastolic sounds. And remember, third heart sound or fourth heart sound are basically low pitched sounds. Every single sound in cardiology is high pitched sound. Only three sounds in cardiology are low pitched. S3, S4 tumor plop that is seen in patients with uh, atrial myxoma. I repeat, every single heart sound that you hear in cardiology are high pitched sounds except three sounds, S3, S4 tumor plop that is heard in atrial myxomas. So that's it. These are the only three low pitched sounds in cardiology. Everything else is going to be high pitched sounds. So what are the important diastolic sounds? We have opening snap. Opening snap is technically due to opening of the atrioventricular valves. When it's thickened, it can produce a sound. This is called snaps, opening snaps. Classic cause MS and TS. But remember, once the valve is calcified, you will lose the opening snap. We know that already. You cannot hear the opening snap. So presence of opening snap indicates a pliable valve. The valve is pliable. Valve is still not calcified. That's the that's what indicates uh, whenever the opening snap is heard. The valve is pliable. Okay. So then second sound is going to be pericardial knock. Pericardial knock. A knocking sound. Again, a diastolic sound. In fact, an early diastolic sound. That's pericardial knock. So pericardial knock is heard in patients with constitutive pericarditis because in peri constitutive pericarditis, the pericardium will be thick, fibrotic, and rigid. So ventricle will try to expand during diastole because it receives blood, but the pericardium will apply a break. It will not allow the ventricle to expand. That application of a break during ventricular expansion is heard as a knocking sound, and that's called as pericardial knock. And then we have another sound that's called as tumor plop. Tumor plop, that is also a diastolic sound heard in patients with atrial myxoma. Atrial myxoma. As I said, only S3, S4, and atrial myxoma. I mean, tumor plop is basically a low pitch sound. Everything else is going to be a high pitch sound in cardiology. And what are the systolic, I mean, multiphasic sounds? The most important multiphasic sound is going to be a pericardial rub. Pericardial rub that will be heard in patients with acute pericarditis and not in chronic constrictive pericarditis, only in acute pericarditis. Remember, if they ask you where the sound will disappear, when the patient develops tamponade, Remember, the most common cause of pericardial effusion in the world is acute pericarditis. Usually, it produces a mild effusion. But once the patient develops severe effusion and once the patient develops tamponade, the rub will disappear. As long as the pericardium is, uh, the two layers are like rubbing against each other, you're going to produce uh, like rub. Once the cavity is filled with fluid and uh, if it gets separated, you will not get the rub. So that's why once the patient develops tamponade, you will lose the rub. Another very important clinical question exam. 
Acute pericarditis, pericardial drip, multiphasic sound. Heard in both systole as well as diastole, a kind of a scratching sound. And another is Harman's crunch. This is also called as Harman's mediastinal crunch. Harman's mediastinal crunch, which is also a kind of a multiphasic sound. So it's a kind of a crunching sound heard in the mediastinal area. This is because of pneumomediastinum. So, you know, one of the important causes of pneumomediastinum in practice is ruptured esophages. If, it, if the esophageal rupture is idiopathic and spontaneous, it is called as Burhaf syndrome. If the esophageal rupture is idiopathic and spontaneous, then only are going to call it as Burhaf syndrome. If it's hydrogenic, that's called hydrogenic esophageal rupture. If it's due to something else, that's not Burhaf syndrome. Only idiopathic spontaneous esophageal rupture is what we call as Burhaf syndrome. Usual signs will be pneumomediastinum and there could be subcutaneous emphysema. These are the usual signs in exam. And you, sometimes you can hear a crunching sound in the mediastinum, often referred to as something called as Amund's uh, mediastinal crunch. So these are the extra hard sounds that you have to know sometimes. And coming to the murmurs, murmurs is very simple in exam. When it comes to neat exam, only few murmurs will be asked. So when it comes to systolic murmur, it could be an early systolic murmur or a mid-systolic murmur or a late systolic murmur or it could be a pan-systolic murmur. You all know that. So, uh, mid-systolic murmur is also called as ejection systolic murmur. Generally, mid-systolic murmur will have the classic diamond shape. So, this is also called as crescendo, decrescendo murmurs. This mid-systolic murmurs are also called as crescendo, decrescendo murmurs or diamond shaped murmurs. So, what are the classic cause of early systolic murmur? So, technically in exam, just remember one cause. This is usually due to papillary muscle dysfunction. Is usually due to papillary muscle dysfunction, which is commonly seen in patients with acute myocardial infarction. We have discussed time and again in our lectures that a type of acute MI that produces papillary muscle dysfunction is inferior MI. Commonly, inferior MI is the one that produces papillary muscle dysfunction by rupturing the posteromedial papillary muscle because of single blood supply, and that's going to produce an early systolic murmur. So, what are the classic cause of ejection systolic murmur or mid systolic murmur? So, typical condition will be outflow tract obstruction. It could be a LV outflow tract obstruction or it could be a RV outflow tract obstruction. LV outflow tract obstruction classic causes AS and HOCM. RV outflow tract obstruction classic cause is going to be a pulmonic stenosis. AS can be a valvular, supravalvular, or subvalvular AS. PS can be a valvular, subvalvular, or supravalvular AS. But in exams, always think about a valvular cause of AS, either a valvular AS or a valvular PS. Another cause is HOCM. In exam, you know that AS murmur is going to here heard, heard best in the right upper sternal border in the right second intercostal space and it will be radiating to both carotids radiating to both the carotids that's typical of AS, a valvular AS. HOCA murmur will be best heard in the left lower sternal border and it's going to show a lot of dynamic variations dynamic changes will be classic we'll talk about that in the subsequent slides and uh, what about PS? PS murmur will be heard better in the left upper sternal border and it's going to increase with expiration and not inspiration so it's in fact the ps well sorry uh, it will increase with inspiration because it's a right sided problem it's going to increase with inspiration ps murmur the mid systolic murmur but lvot obstruction causes will increase with expiration because it's a left sided problem all these murmurs are going to increase the expiration but hocm murmur typically will not show much changes with uh, respiratory changes though so only the as murmur will show a little change with expression but otherwise hsa murmur will not show much change with expression but there will be a lot of dynamic variations and coming to late systolic and one one more important thing is if they ask about uh, innocent murmur most of the innocent murmurs most of the innocent and benign murmurs tend to produce esm quality only they'll be usually esm type only most of the innocent murmurs in practice so, like for example, hyperdynamic states itself. Hyperdynamic states itself, because of heavy blood flow, sometimes can produce innocent murmur anywhere in the heart. So, we have to be a little careful. Most of the benign murmurs, hyperdynamic states can produce ESM type murmur. But in exam, ESM means think about AS, PS, or HOCM depending on the location. Right upper sternal border, AS, left lower sternal border, HOCM, and left upper sternal border, it's going to be PS. And what about uh, late systolic murmur? We have discussed already. Mammary is a continuous murmur. Okay. Um, late uh, systolic murmur. Where you see, already we have discussed. If there is an MVP with MR. So this is a classic cause of late systolic murmur. There will be a mid-systolic click followed by a late systolic murmur. This is typical of mitral valve prolapse with MR. We know that. 
That's because of redundant cordae, not papillary muscle. Rather, cordae will be redundant here. That's the problem. So what about pan-systolic murmur? Three classic causes, TR, MR, and VST. So how will you differentiate? TR murmurs will be heard better in the left lower sternal border. And JVP will be definitely elevated. And uh, you're going to have the classic JVP waveforms like attenuated X descent, large V wave, CV fusion with the prominent Y descent. And you're also going to have the d effect that is increased with inspiration. Anytime whenever the right side event increases with inspiration, this is often referred to as something called as d sign or d effect. And what about MR? So this is d sign basically. right sided problems are going to increase with inspiration. So this is d effect or d sign. So what is MR murmur? MR murmur will be heard better in the apex because it's a mitral problem. JVP will be typically normal. It won't be elevated unless until there is pulmonary hypertension. And it's going to increase with expiration, not with inspiration because it's a left-sided problem. A VSD murmurs will be heard in the left lower sternal border. JVP will be typically normal unless until there is pulmonary hypertension. And you are uh, going to have augmentation of murmur with expression because the blood flow is from LV to RV. So that's why it's going to uh, increase with expiration. So you won't see decarbolose effect in patients with left-sided problems. That's a very important problem. Can you tell me there is only one condition that disobeys the decarbolose sign? It's the pulmonary valvular ejection click. Very commonly asked in exam. Pulmonary valvular ejection click. Not the murmur of the pulmonary stenosis. Pulmonary valvular ejection click will be seen in patients with pulmonic stenosis sometimes. And this pulmonary valvular ejection click is the only like sound on the right side that disobeys the decarbolose law, which means it is the only sound that increases with expiration and not with inspiration. In fact, it decreases with inspiration and increases with expiration due to a variety of mechanisms. So if they ask you an exam, the only sound or the only condition, only thing that disobeys the decarbolose sign on the right side, that is the pulmonary valvular ejection click. So that increases the expression and decreases the inspiration. All the other right side events are going to get augmented with inspiration. That's about systolic murmurs. What about the diastolic murmurs though? So we have the early diastolic murmur and we have the mid-diastolic murmur. Mid-diastolic murmur. So classic cause of early diastolic murmur is going to be AR and PR. Aortic regurgitation and pulmonic regurgitation. Pulmonary regurgitation can be of two types. One is called as hypertensive PR, that is with pulmonary hypertension. Second is without pulmonary hypertension also, you can have uh, pulmonary regurgitation that's called as non-hypertensive PR. So if you hear a PR early diastolic murmur with pulmonary hypertension, everyone knows that has got a special name called as Graham steel murmur. That's also referred to as something called as Graham steel murmur. That's a special name given to hypertensive pulmonary regurgitation. So two classic conditions, AR, PR, that's all. So in PR, if it's a hypertensive PR, that is pulmonary hypertension related PR, that's called as Graham steel murmur. So what are the cause of mid-diastolic murmur technically? So mid-diastolic murmur classically is due to MS and TS. The clues for MS and TS will be the fact that opening snap will be positive. Most of the patients will be having loud S1. Plus at the same time, there will be a pre-systolic accentuation. In most patients, there will be a pre-systolic accentuation. We discussed about that pre-systolic accentuation already in the valvular heart disease section. So this is a typical example of a MS murmur. We're going to have a mid-diastolic mid murmur with a pre-systolic accentuation. Just before the systole, the murmur intensity will increase. That's because of the atrial kick against a stenosed valve. So that's the reason for pre-systolic accentuation. And it's important to note that this pre-systolic accentuation will be lost in atrial fibrillation because it's due to atrial contraction. It Once the AF sets in, the pre-systolic accentuation will be lost. Even that is a very common question in exam. So apart from MSTS, what are the other differential diagnoses? Uh, it can be seen in acute rheumatic fever. If it's seen in acute rheumatic fever, it's called as Karakum's murmur. Karakum's murmur, I think we have discussed that also in the valvular heart disease section. So that's called as Karakum's murmur, which is basically a mid diastolic murmur due to mitral valvulitis that is going to produce turbulent flow. And it can be seen in severe AR. If it's seen in severe AR, that's called as Austin Flint murmur. The reason is severe aortic regurgitation. Again, we discussed that in the valvular heart disease section. If you think carefully, I told you the jet will impinge on the anterior mitral leaflet, resulting in a kind of a functional mitral stenosis. That's what we call it as Austin Flint murmur that is seen in patients with severe aortic regurgitation. Okay, fine. So these are the diastolic murmur, important diastolic murmurs. Then we have something called as continuous murmurs. So what are the important differential diagnoses for continuous murmur? Always 
Uh, first one is PDA, that is patent ductus arteries, the persistent patent ductus arteries. It's also called as Gibson's murmur, always called as Gibson's machinery murmur, which is typically heard in the Gibson's area. We have added detailed discussion of where is the Gibson's area. It can be seen in AV fistulas, it can be seen in iatopulmary windows. And you know, the only place where you hear the shunt murmur in AST. I told you so many times, in which condition you will hear the shunt murmur in AST. Only condition where you hear the shunt murmur in AST. Otherwise, you don't hear shunt murmur in AST at all. We discussed that already. Yes, that is lutum Bacca syndrome, which is a combination of MS and AST. This is the only condition where there will be a shunt murmur in AST. Continuous murmur, in fact. That's correct. And, um, you know, another condition is ruptured sinus of Valsalva aneurysm. That's called as RSOV aneurysm. That is ruptured sinus of Valsalva aneurysm, especially if it's ruptured into the right-sided chambers like RA or RV. You will hear a continuous murmur because aortic pressure will always be more than that of the right sided pressures. And uh, you can also hear um, in collaterals of coarctation of aorta. From collaterals of coarctation of aorta, you are going to have a continuous murmur. We discussed that. What is that sign called as anyone? If you are going to hear the continuous murmur of collaterals of coarctation of aorta in the right infrascapular region, especially. So, what is that sign called as? There's a special name to that, right? We have discussed that already. Anyone? Sussman sign. I think we have discussed that. I told you last time. That's called a Sussman sign. Right? If you are the continuous continuous murmur of collaterals of coitation of white in the infrascapular region, often referred to as something called a Sussman sign. And uh, two innocent conditions. One is called as mammary sofal. Mammary sofal. Uh, it is a continuous murmur due to high blood flow in the lactating mother's breast. And next is venous hum. It is again because of hyperdynamic flow in the veins of certain children. That's called as venous hum. So these two are benign conditions, innocent conditions that can produce continuous murmur. Mammary sofal and venous hum. So these are some of the important examples of continuous murmur. And this is actually not continuous murmur. Sorry for the uh, wrong uh, topic. It's basically dynamic auscultation. So what we are going to discuss is dynamic auscultation in a nutshell. Dynamic auscultation. So, what are the murmurs that are going? I mean, I'm going to split into two. So, because this is very important. First, most murmurs, how they're going to behave, and murmur of MVP and HOCM, how they're going to behave. So, MVP and HOCM murmur should be completely like uh, taken aback. So, they are going to completely behave in a different way. So, what is going to happen with most murmurs with respiration? MVP and HOCM murmur will not change that much with HOCM. I mean, with the respiration, both inspiration as well as expiration. You might argue that these murmurs should increase the expression because they are left-sided problems, but generally they don't change that much with uh, respiration. But in exam, if at all they are persisting on whether it will increase with expression or, uh, expression or inspiration, you can say they might increase the expression, theoretically speaking, but that should not be the case. You should not write that. They won't have significant change with respiration. But we know that left-sided problems are going to get augmented with expiration, whereas right-sided problems like TR murmur is going to get augmented with inspiration. Very, very important. Because the flows to the left side is going to increase with expiration, flows to the right side is going to increase with inspiration. So what about the preload? So whenever preload increases, murmur is going to increase for sure because more blood. Whenever preload decreases, most of the murmurs are going to decrease. Obviously, your MVP and HOCM murmur is going to act in the opposite way. So, whenever preload increases, the MVP and HOCM murmur comes down. Whenever preload decreases, MVP and HOCM murmur will increase. Very, very important point. Remember in MVP and HOCM, when whichever direction the load is going, you are going to only have opposite arrows. I should like write here, right? So, whenever whatever direction the load goes, in MVP and HOCM, the murmur will go in the opposite direction only. That's why I told you a clue also. HOCM is basically not hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. When it comes to load, HOCM is hypertrophic opposite cardiomyopathy. So whatever direction the load goes, murmur goes in the opposite direction and obstruction also goes in the opposite direction. That's what is important. And now, whatever increase or decrease after load, you know MVP and HOCM murmur is going to go in the opposite direction. Increase after load is going to decrease the murmur and decrease after load is going to increase the murmur. So I can clearly say, the murmur of HOCM MVP is going to go in the opposite direction. So it's easy to remember. So whatever direction the load goes, MVP and HOCM is going to move in the opposite direction. And you all know what are the conditions that increase the preload, right? So what are the conditions that increase the preload? Leg raising. That's called as passive leg raising. And most important maneuver is 
uh, squatting maneuver, squatting. These are two important things that's going to increase the preload. So what's going to reduce the preload? So standing, that's called squat to stand maneuver. That's going to reduce the preload. Another important condition maneuver that reduces the preload is going to be valsalva in the strain phase especially. Valsalva in the strain phase will reduce the venous return. So that's going to basically reduce the preload. What's going to increase the afterload? Isometric hand grip. Classic is isometric hand grip in clinical practice. What's going to reduce the afterload whenever you give a vasodilator? Any vasodilator for that matters. Like for example, in exams, they will target something called amyl nitrate inhalation in clinical practice, amyl nitrate inhalation. This is going to basically cause vasodilation and reduce the afterload. So now you know. So HOCM MVP in a different direction. So other murmurs, whenever preload increases, the murmur will increase. All other murmurs, if the preload decreases, murmurs are going to decrease. So what about afterload? Here there will be a small difference. We can split into stenotic murmurs and regurgitant murmurs. Stenotic murmurs and regurgitant murmurs. Again, I can write stenotic murmurs and regurgitant murmurs. So what about stenotic murmurs? Stenotic means we are talking about aortic stenotic murmur that is basically going to decrease with increase in afterload. Stenotic murmurs and regurgitant murmurs are going to increase with increase in afterload. Similarly, with decrease in afterload, stenotic murmurs will basically increase and uh, regurgitant murmurs like MR and AR is basically going to yeah, decrease with decreasing afterload. Stenotic murmurs is going to decrease with increase in afterload. And uh, regurgitant murmurs will increase with increase in afterload. And stenotic murmurs will increase with decrease in afterload. And regurgitant murmurs can decrease with decrease in afterload. The only exception for this rule is MS. Only exception for the rule is MS. MS technically has no change. MS will not change that much with like changes in the afterload. If you look at the hemodynamics, it's such a way that MS is not going to change that much. Because MS is a diastolic event and changes in afterload is not going to change the diastolic event in atrium and ventricle. So that much. So that's the reason why MS will not have so much of changes with uh, changes in the afterload. But AS murmur, yes, AS murmur is definitely going to produce a significant change with increase or decrease in afterload. But unlike, I mean, not like HOC murmur. HOC murmur is going to have so much of change, but AS murmur still shows some change. So what you can notice is, look at this carefully in exam, this one, this might be very important. So whenever afterload is increasing, AS murmur is decreasing. Whenever afterload is decreasing, AS murmur is increasing. Similarly, whenever afterload is increasing, AS, HOC murmur is also decreasing. Whenever AS murmur is, whenever uh, afterload is decreasing, HOC murmur is also increasing, which means with regards to afterload, AS and HOCM are like similar or different, similar dynamics or different. With regards to afterload alone, what is the AS and HOC, HOCM murmur behavior? It's almost same, right? Same or different? That's where the examiners will confuse you. AS murmur as well as HOCM murmur, with regards to afterload, they produce similar changes. So where you're going to find out the difference is with preload only. So the preload is the one that's going to tell you the difference. AS murmur definitely will increase with preload and decrease, uh, in, increase with increase in preload and decrease with decrease in preload. Whereas HOCM murmur is going to do the opposite where it's going to decrease with increase in preload and increase with decrease in preload. So that is why this is more important. So when it comes to AS versus HOCM difference. So with the load, you will not be able to differentiate the dynamic uh, changes in the murmur with AS and HOCM. With preload only, you will, you will be able to make a good difference out of it. I think so this table, uh, not very complicated, but not so easy also, but this is like a wholesome table that explains all the dynamic auscultation in a single place. So if you remember this table, it will be very, very useful for exams. You can crack any number of questions when it comes to AS, HOCM or MVP murmur. And that completes our today's discussion on cardiology clinics and hope it was useful. Thank you very much. Have a nice time. Good night. See you in the next session soon. Good night, guys. Thank you.